Oh, Grant. Hey, good morning, Jared. Morning, everyone. Good morning. <clears throat> Peter. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Shelly. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the May 6, 2021 uh, meeting of the Water Quality Monitoring Council. Karen or, or Mark, did you want to kick things off? Or do you want me to kind of just do the, the beginning pieces? Yeah, get going, uh, Nick. Yeah, well, right. go for it. Hold on. Great. So just a couple of things uh, to kick it off. Um, uh, we are, this meeting is re being recorded, so meet your mics when you're not talking. Um, and then uh, if you are feel comfortable with having your video on while, sp uh, while speaking, that makes it for um, a more interactive experience. Um, otherwise, treat uh, each other with respect and, and recognize that we are being recorded and this will be made live uh, at the end of the meeting. I'm going to use the, um, the Zoom list for um, for the participants. So if you are not a council member, when we go through roll call, go ahead and feel free to um, add your, your name in the uh, clear description of your name in, in the participant list. And um, if that's not doable, go ahead and add it to the chat and I'll make a record of that, just uh, your name and affiliation. <clears throat> so I'm still adding a couple more folks from the participant list. Let's see. Now I'll go ahead and start. Uh, with uh, the council members and alternates that are in attendance today. Um, let's go ahead and start with our co-chairs, um, the Cal EPA. Good morning, I'm uh, Karen Mogus, the co-chair of the council representing Cal EPA. And in my other role, I am the deputy director of Division of Water Quality here at the State Board. Thanks, Karen. Natural Resources Agency. I'm Mark Gold, the other co-chair, and I am Deputy Secretary for Ocean and Coastal Policy and the Executive Director of the Ocean Protection Council. Great. Uh, drinking water. Hi, this is Andrew Altvogt. I'm Assistant Deputy Director with the Division of Drinking Water over our resiliency and data branch. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, regulated Community uh, Publicly Owned Treatment Works. Good morning. This is Shelly Walther. Uh, yes, I am the representative for uh, the regulated community publicly owned treatment works, and I'm an environmental scientist at Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. Great. Hi, good morning. Uh, Jared Boskul, manager of regulatory affairs for CASA and the alternate for the POTWs. Thank you. Regulated community stormwater. Hi, good morning, everyone. Grant Sharp, representative for the regulated stormwater community. I work for Orange County Public Works and is a manager of the South Orange County Watershed Management Area. Hi, um, this is Brian Lawrenson from Larry Walker Associates. I'm the alternate MS4 representative. Right, thanks, Brian. Agriculture. Good morning. I'm Mark Cady uh, at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. I am an alternate for uh, our executive office. Uh, I manage the fertilizer research and education program here. Thanks, Mark. Community monitoring groups. OK. 
and new Helen. Um, Hi. Hi, it's Miriam uh, Viney, alternate to Helen. Uh, thank you. And uh, the public or NGOs. Good morning. Um, my name is Ray Heimstra, uh, and I'm the uh, public member of the board, and uh, I'm also associate director at Orange County Coast Keeper. Hi, morning, Ray. And next, uh, scientific community. Hi, I'm Steve Weisberg. I'm with the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project Authority. Morning, Steve. Water supply. Hey, everybody. I'm Peter Vroom, uh, Deputy Director of San Diego Public Utilities. Morning, Peter. And US EPA. Hi, Saw Terry. Saw Terry. Terry Fleming from the Environmental Protection Agency. I am a liaison to the council. Uh, morning, Terry. Morning. Well, thank you. We got a full house. Everybody's represented, so that's great. Um, I think it's the first time in a long time. So I'm glad to see you all. Thanks for making the time this morning. Um, is there any adjustments that uh, anyone has to the agenda? I do not. Everybody uh, is consistent with how it was set up and distributed prior. Um, so if there are any adjustments, please speak them now. Do you want me to walk through our agenda real quick? We typically do that at the beginning just sure. to make sure everyone knows what to expect. So we start out with our housekeeping items, which we're trying to complete right now. We'll have a public forum for anyone to speak to the council on any topics that are not already on the agenda. We'll provide time for announcements and updates from council members and our executive director. Then we'll move on to our first subcommittee update on uh, the uh, wastewater-based epidemiology subcommittee. Then we'll move to the update of our governance document and hopefully everyone had a chance to take a look at that and uh, provide input uh, ahead of the meeting. We'll take a break and return to get a presentation from our trash work group on the trash monitoring methods and assessment playbook. Then move on in the same theme on trash and microplastics to get a presentation on remote sensing of plastic debris and round out that theme with a, a presentation on monitoring and assessment playbooks for microplastics. And uh, then the end of the meeting, we will uh, be led by Mark Gold on a brainstorming uh, activity on how to uh, obtain funding for the council. And then finally, uh, agenda topics for our next meeting and adjourning about 1230. So any comments, questions, suggestions for adjusting the agenda? All right, sounds good. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, no problem, thank you. Um, next on the agenda as part of the housekeeping would be uh, to approve the action items um, or voice any sort of uh, comments that I received. I did not receive any. Um, we generally haven't been approving them per se. So, I mean, if there were no comments and they've been posted online and they were made available for you, if you do have comments that didn't have a chance to review, just please reach out and we can go over them in the future. Otherwise, we can go ahead and move on. On to item number two, public forum. So this gives a chance for members of the public to address the council um, with any matter related to the council's jurisdiction that's not on the agenda. If there is anybody in the public that would like to address the public forum now, please raise your hand in the participant list or uh, say so in the chat. Doesn't look like it. it does not look like it. Vicki, I see that you have a chat that says you can't hear. I'm sorry to hear, hear that. That might be something on your end. I, it seems like everybody else. Um, can hear. Uh, okay. Uh, Wynn Calgar uh, would like to. Okay. Thanks, Ricky. Wynn, uh, go ahead. Thanks so much. Um, 
Yeah, so one thing I, so I, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Riverside and I study trash. I'm on the trash monitoring um, work group and I'm leading uh, the data group there. And one, one thing that we have a really big challenge with is uh, gaining access to data on trash in the environment from different government agencies throughout California. Um, and some of the challenges there are that the data is not being collected in any standardized format. We have data sets that are being c collected, um, you know, using mass, using counts, using all of these different metrics, and as well having many different methods um, to collect that data. Um, and then to, to add challenge to this, the data is not available in any, any public forum. And um, so I'm, I'm wondering, if, if this group has ideas on how to improve the current status of trash data, um, I think that it's a real opportunity for us um, as a state to, we, we're leading the country right now um, by having the trash amendments and by having um, all of these municipalities uh, actually managing trash in their rivers. I mean, it's, the, there's no one else doing this in, in the country like we're doing it. Um, and I think if we capitalize on this situation and start collecting um, data from all of these efforts and, and using that to inform our future um, management of trash and rivers, I think that we could really set a great example um, for how people solve the problem of trash and rivers. Uh, so, yeah, any, any thoughts on that? Other than it's a great point, and I think it's been an issue literally for 20 years. Um, and so um, uh, Nick and Karen, you know, on the, on the one hand, you know, it's a non-agendized item. So to go into it in detail, I don't think is generally um, allowed. And we have a full agenda, although trash is the theme. But um, does it make sense to put it on potentially the next agenda or does it sort of fall into the category of not having access not having sort of a, a, a centralized data hub um, that's adequately populated for many, many different monitoring parameters? Um, what, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, my, my, my thoughts and, and Karen, feel free to chime in. Are, I mean, Wynn's been very active uh, with the, the trash monitoring work group. He's one of the leads for the data management right. piece. And one of his main focuses is a trash data model to help try to solve this issue. I think that this does actually kind of fall in under item number six, there's a playbook. And, you know, the, one of the big reasons for the playbooks being funded by OPC and, and becoming fruition was a recognition that there were, wasn't a set of trash methods for are um, the people who regulate or other people to utilize, to utilize when trying to answer their trash related issues. So I think with that release, and I think Shelly is gonna talk about this, Shelly Moore, is about you know, what are the potential uses for that playbook and expanded um, expansion of that, that playbook and how it, once we get, if we can as a council spread the word of the playbook exists and can be a tool to be used when trying to look at your trash monitoring programs that can help with the consistency, at least as the data is being collected. Um, I think, I think that's half, I think that's half the issue, Nick. The other is submitting the data in a timely right. manner. So it actually can be analyzed. That's, that's, that was my second piece. I know the trash oh, is, being, is being looked at um, for being in addition to seed in um, and it's, it's underway, but I think it's, it's a, it is, a, it's an important topic. I think it's one that the, the trash monitoring work group is, is struggling with. And that's why when is bringing it up, um, I, I think we could have a presentation. I just don't know if there's any clear answers. Um, to, um, is it in part of me, this is, you know, my second meeting as co-chair. Is it typical though, that we would get, you know, a, a concise series of recommendations from the individual um, task forces so that we can, you know, act upon them or what, what ends up happening typically? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely our role is to hear what the working groups are running into, what challenges they're running into to make data available. And so I would say, let's hear the presentation throughout this day and uh, agendize for a future meeting as a, a 
a more uh, as needed discussion of how do we get the the data available to decision makers and the public. Uh, you know, what's the status now? What are the barriers? What are the ways that the council could um, assist and remove barriers? So I, I, I absolutely think it's. Oh, okay. that, that sounds great. I would just say then, you know, for, you know, if we, if we agendize that for the next meeting or the meeting after, you know, that the working group would give us, you know, their recommendations on what needs to be done. And that would be the, the focus of the discussion, but to actually have something in writing on what the working group recommendations are, would be helpful. Agreed. Okay, cool. I, I would also recommend that uh, we include Jarma Bennett in the in the meeting, maybe invite her to come to the council meeting. And uh, I, I assume that Wynn has already um, interfaced with her about seed in. So I know you've been very involved yeah. and, and trying to get things into seed in. She's so, on that uh, team. With, with regard to seed in, you know, that we have NPDES uh, required monitoring that doesn't fit in. <laughs> so we're, we're still working on that end too. And we, you know, we, we all, we want to get all of our data in there, but it's, it's, it's not, uh, Quite right, especially for trawl trash. Okay. So, for those of you who don't know who Jarma Bennett is, she works for the Office of Information Management and Analysis here at the State Board, and she is the primary lead on uh, Seeden. She's the project manager, really, on the program side for Seeden, and works with the user group and getting data in. So just for context. Yeah. Great, thanks. Anyone else from the public? Seeing none. Well, thank you, Wynn. We'll move on to item number three, announcements and updates. So we'll go ahead and, and start from, uh, from the top, top down again on um, council member and alternate updates. Uh, we'll start with, with Karen, do you have any? Or raise your hand, I suppose, if, if you have one. <laughs> I can go down. Well, you 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 covered the one you have in your list of things, uh, the AB ten sixty six, which is what I was going to mention. But I'll let you, I'll let you talk about that, Nick, and I'll chime in with what I know when you get there. So okay. we'll go to the other council members. Okay, I'll start with the the folks with their hands up, and then um, circle back to make sure that no others have updates they want to bring up. So we'll start with uh, Grant Sharp. Yeah, hi, good morning, everyone. I just wanted to provide a brief update on the inventory of monitoring subcommittee. We're not officially on the agenda uh, this morning, um, but we have been active since uh, we provided our update to you at the February 11th meeting. Uh, so um, on April 19th, uh, Shelly, uh, myself, um, Helen, uh, uh, Fatanities and uh, Alma, um, who's actually uh, replacing Jared on that uh, subcommittee. We all met and uh, we went over the, the feedback, the comments that we heard from the council at the February 11th meeting. We got a lot of great uh, direction uh, as far as, um, you know, where to, where to take this. So our plan of attack uh, right now is to um, develop a very short, hopefully uh, no more than about one page scope uh, or prospectus that we would um, then bring back to the council for more feedback, um, hopefully by the August meeting. Uh, and this scope would, would lay out our proposed approach, how we would, we would go about uh, developing this inventory of monitoring um, just uh, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, based on, on the, the, the discussions we've had, um, we're thinking that the, probably the, uh, the way to approach this is to, is to start with uh, maybe a, 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 a small case study using our proposed approach, um, you know, just so uh, we have something that uh, we can wrap our arms around and uh, not try and um, uh, tackle the whole thing all at once, but uh, that's the main update this morning is look for, look for a short, uh, hopefully very uh, short um, scope uh, laying out our proposed approach for the August meeting. Great. 
Great. Great, thanks, Grant. Um, next up, Ray, Ray Heimstra. Hi, I just uh, wanted to let, let everybody know that I'm working with Eric Burris on a workshop to uh, inform the public on how to access the various water quality databases. We had one uh, last year that kind of focused on smarts, and of course there's lots more, so uh, we're just uh, work it, working on that. Hey, thanks, Ray. Uh, Andrew. Yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, we released in uh, early April our uh, drinking water needs assessment, looking at the needs of small drinking water systems um, and um, and sort of the, the, the types of solutions that were needed, the number of systems that are at risk for failure, um, for failures in the future. Um, as well as the costs and um, affordability metrics associated with that. So I just wanted to let everybody know that that was out now. Thanks. Great, Andrew. And is that available on the, the Division Drinky Water website? It is, yeah. It is. Okay. And I, I can provide a link or I could give you the link, Nick, to send around that, as well. That'd be great if you could provide me the link. And if, if you have time to drop it in the chat, that would be awesome. That'd be great as well. Thank you. Peter, Peter Broom. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to let you know, um, Anna Holder, who I believe is uh, participating in our meeting this morning, contacted me. She is the Swamp Bioaccumulation Monitoring Program Coordinator. Um, they are having a program um, realignment and asked me to serve on the advisory committee, which I accepted. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more details in the near future um, and helping uh, with that uh, endeavor. Yeah, great. Thanks, Peter, uh, for, for agreeing to do that. It'll be, I think your expertise will be a lot of help. That, that realignment, it's, it's, it's going to be a good thing. Um, it's going to include several things, but in, also um, including changing the name from the bar to the safe to eat work group and some other things for messaging and, and being more inclusive. And so Anna's doing some great things. And um, thanks again, Peter. Um, next up, uh, Mark Gold. Um, yeah, just a just a reminder. We have our next uh, OPC meeting on June fifteenth, and um, there'll be a significant amount of discussion on ocean acidification and hypoxia. It's not necessarily monitoring per se, but investment um, in uh, either either past or or upcoming monitoring efforts um, related to that. Uh, mostly on um, trying to look at at the impacts on of OAH on um, marine organisms. I know Steve and, and a bunch of other people, Steve Weisberg and others have been, have been involved in it. We had it, uh, recommendations, a document should come out, gosh, in a week or two, um, with, uh, with um, uh, sort of recommendations of a limited pot of money uh, with all the work that's going on from the oozes and squirp and cow coffee, et cetera, on um, what, can be done to sort of look at OAH impacts um, from a monitoring perspective um, in the water in the, ne in the next uh, couple of years. It's not a heck of a lot of money to spread across all those programs, but we're hoping that it'll serve sort of as a catalyst of um, other future funding, which might be a little bit naive, but you never know. Um, the other thing is also a as a heads up for everyone that the, um, the May revised budget uh, we'll be out the end of next week. Um, uh, I don't think monitoring did that great, um, unfortunately. Um, and again, a lot of that is because the investments are really this one-time thing. It is the, the, really the focus is one-time investments um, and monitoring is looked at as an ongoing financial commitment. And so we continue to struggle in that realm. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the, at the, end of the meeting, but just wanted to give you a heads up because there is a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff that's very pertinent to your interests that will be part of the May revise. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jared. Hi, good morning, council members. Uh, just wanted to provide a brief update that this will be my last meeting serving as the alternate for the POTWs on the council. 
Um, I'm going to nominate Alma Mashoshi from CASA. She's our legislative and regulatory analyst. And uh, she's coordinated with Shelly and Nick um, to take over for me. But just wanted to give a deep heartfelt thank you to all the council members for the honor to serve beside you. And we'll look forward to watching your work and effort uh, in the going forward. And uh, happy to be involved in any way I can through Alma. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for your service on the, the council and the subcommittees. Yeah, I want to I want to just also express my thanks for Jared's engagement in the council and and many of the subcommittees and his thoughtful input. It's been really great to have you and uh, I know I'll see you around <laughs> in other <laughs> venues. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you so much for your engagement in the in the group. And like to also thank you, Jared. Uh, you know, I remember when you first started with CASA and you just kind of really dove right in um, to uh, stepping up to be my alternate. And uh, it's been great working with you uh, on the council matters. Appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to, to doing the same with Alma. Steve, Steve Weisberg. So I want to announce a workshop that will be taking place in February of next year that uh, will take place in California in part because of the Water Quality Monitoring Council having created a molecular methods work group. Um, the federal agencies um, are going to hold what is the second national eDNA, marine DNA, eDNA conference, and they're going to do it in California February 1st through 4th of next year. Uh, the goal of the workshop is to coordinate the uh, rollout strategies, the research strategies of the, uh, of the federal agencies around eDNA. And the first one was held in New Jersey. They wanted to hold the second one, obviously, on another coast. And they were particularly drawn to California because they want to figure out how the federal strategies and the state strategies intertwine. The fact that we had a Water Quality Monitoring Council and that we had a Molecular Methods work group that was looking to do that within the state uh, uh, was one of the factors that led them to do it in California. Uh, I'll be able to give you probably next month a, a better look at what the agenda is and a registration website, uh, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, the, I think the two co-chairs of our committee are uh, Susie Thoreau and Rachel Meyer. They're on the planning committee for the workshop. Thanks, Steve. That's great news. Uh, that group's done some awesome work in a short amount of time. Yeah. And uh, Shelly, Shelly Walther. Thanks, Nick. I just wanted to uh, uh, just mention the uh, model uncertainty, uh, ocean acidification model uncertainty workshop uh, that SWERP is hosting in, uh, uh, on May 28th. Uh, part of model uncertainty uh, analysis is comparing it to monitoring data. And so uh, we know that uh, having a, a robust uh, set of monitoring data is, is really key to, to doing that. And, and that's something that we're going to need to think about and support going forward. So it might be of interest to those of you who are keyed into this topic to attend the workshop. And uh, also another big thing that's been going on, and we've, we've had a series of webinars that you can catch on the, on the SWERP website, uh, uh, the recordings, excellent speakers of the last four weeks. and. Um, also, uh, we've been working on um, the uh, OPC uh, wastewater treatment plant microplastics uh, study design, and uh, it's been it's been a lot of good work that's coming out of that, including <clears throat> talking about method standardization. So, um, a lot of good things that maybe we might be able to report out on uh, just the progress in the fall. Thanks, Shelly. Thank you. Yeah, if you can, if, if, if that, those webinars and the registration for that workshop is readily available and open to a broad audience, you want to share it, um, please reach out. I'd be more happy to share the information. Any others, any other council members or alternates that didn't have their hand up and something and had an epiphany? All right, well, then, then I'm up. Okay, so I, um, First on, on my list of things to update you on is um, I attended and, and really you know worked the 
the 2021 um, National Conference for the National Water Quality Monitoring Council. It took place from April 19th to the 23rd. Um, it was the first time they've attempted to do that virtually, um, completely virtually, and it was um, it was a, it was it was a success. It was it was difficult um, with such a huge audience, um, near over a thousand of people attending and having so many talks across so many different um, topics. Um, we did have uh, a couple of speakers. We, I know that Anna Holder was was nominated to to present on the healthy watersheds work, but because of registration requirements in California, that was not possible. But we did we were able to get um, Su Susie Thoreau from Squirp and the Molecular Methods Work Group to present on, on her work. And some really interesting eDNA sessions took place uh, during the conference, and even a follow up discussion on Friday. Um, on a national scale. So it was really great to see and, and share information about the work group in California with, with a, a much broader audience and gain some interest. A lot of people were very impressed by the work that's being done here in California, which Steve touched on. Another big focus of the national conference was incorporating the justice, equity, and diversity and inclusion aspects, um, anywhere from you know asking people to identify their pronouns, but also the indigenous lands that they work on, starting off from the beginning. Um, there were training sessions on the kind of day zero, which is the Monday, which is kind of more of a, um, a voluntary area where you can take sessions within specific topics you're interested in. They did some um, implicit bias trainings there that were open to everybody and, um, and trainings. And they were kind of, they used a, a platform that allowed for a lot of community discussions, which was interesting. And you could post topics and communicate throughout the entire conference. And then had follow-up sessions on Friday that built upon the discussions that started off Monday and then had a lot for people to reflect on then the middle three days and the other sessions they saw on opportunities for incorporating um, the Jedi issues within their their professional arena. Um, there were a lot of recommendations at the end of that to have a more official um, and lasting work group of the National Council. Um, focused on Jedi efforts because there was a lot of um, desire and, and energy behind having a place on a national scale of resources and shared experiences and, and strategies uh, across states and um, the national level um, from federal agencies. Uh, so I think that that's going to be proposed likely at the, the June uh, National Council meeting. So we'll see what comes in from that. And it could be a, a role for... Um, the Jedi subcommittee of uh, of this of, of this council, which you know didn't have an opportunity to to meet over the last quarter or to make much progress, but I think in the, in moving forward, this could be a, a way to to kind of kick that kickstart that effort again uh, on, a, on a larger scale. Um, what else? Let's see the uh, the next big conference. If we're talking conferences, the next big one coming up is going to be the 2021 Data Science Symposium. Uh, we've added a day zero to that event. It's going to um, so it's the 28th to the 30th. On the 28th, we're going to have a a discussion and um, a screening of the film Paya, which focuses on the Owens uh, Valley watershed and the um, impacts and decisions of government on the the tribal Paiute Indians or Native Americans on those lands and uh, include a panel discussion of um, tribal members to discuss that topic. And then we're having two full days of presentations and sessions. We have a great keynote speaker um, yeah, that's going to focus on equity and impacts to our environmental impacts. Uh, so I encourage you all to attend um, uh, all of it if you can and, and participate. We are, you know, a lot of my work goes into helping Anna Holder, who admittedly Anna does a lot of the work at this point, but um, um, uh, the council is identified as a partner in this symposium and um, we try to highlight the council and the work groups while we um, do within the presentations. Uh, a draft agenda is to be posted soon on our website and I can drop a link in, um, in the future. So look for that. Um, the Water Data Consortium. So I sit on the steering committee representing the um, council on the Water Data Consortium. They've, they're they firming up their kind of mission statements and their their um, 
their uh, kind of strategic planning efforts, uh, provide a lot of input on that, a lot of approval on their steering committee meetings. But kind of more importantly, they're they've got three pilot projects they're they're moving forward on with uh, technical experts and trying to kick off the ground. One's focused on lidar, the other is on urban water and delta use, and the third is on the groundwater uh, GSAs. Um, they're still pretty much in in the infancy stages, but as they start to take off and start to develop more um, uh, kind of plans on how they want to address these on a smaller scale, I think we'll probably be sharing them with the larger council to get input and feedback on those. So um, those groups meet pretty often. Um, and so that if you're interested on any of those specific topics, let me know and I can fill you in on kind of um, where they're going and um, maybe potentially provide an area for, for you all to participate. Um, AB 1066 is a new is pending legislation from uh, Assembly Member uh, Richard Bloom. It is a program focused on freshwater, inland freshwater beach monitoring for public health, similar to um, AB 411 for the coastal beaches. Uh, it does, it names the council, uh, the modern council, and um, not only names them, but uh, identifies them as a key identifies a key deliverable for the council to produce, which would be a recommendation for a definition of what a freshwater beach monitoring site is. Um, I think you can, I don't, I'm, it's hard for me to drop a link in, but if Karen, if you can, or somebody else can drop a link into the chat, that'd be helpful. It has the legislation language and it provides a little bit of um, guidance on what could be included on, in the definition. And so the council rule, at least as written now, is to come together and provide a, def a, a recommended definition. And then that allows the state water board to um, view those recommendations, hear those recommendations and develop a uh, more uh, regulatory based definition for them, for their use um, to help develop a program that would have a monitoring system that would uh, monitor on a weekly basis for fecal indicator bacteria, specifically E. coli, or what's consistent with the 2012 EPA recommended criteria on a weekly basis from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh, in addition, it, has a, it would have a public facing um, way to show the results in a timely manner uh, so that it could help capture uh, the much needed, much needed data gap that's been going on at the inland uh, recreational sites. So I spent the better part of the last couple of weeks helping with um, fiscal analysis of what that could do, just digging into the data sources that we had to try to just get a grasp on how many water bodies there are on the inside and, and how much of a lift this could be. So, um, uh, but it, I thought it was really cool and interesting to see that the council was named and had a key deliverable. So I think that that, that means that our, our name is, is getting out there and becoming more prominent. Um, and it's being recognized as, as an opportunity to, to move forward. Um, and then um, I'm going out on leave starting May 19th. So we'll talk more about that. Um, my, my wife's having our second baby, so I'll be taking care of, uh, of them for, for a while. So we can talk a little bit more about that at the end, but I'm gonna be gone for the better part of this quarter. Um, so I don't have to discuss on what the council wants to do about that and the planning for the next meeting. Um, and uh, some of the other things that are happening. So um, that's kind of my big news. If there's any questions on those topics that I can fill in, uh, speak now. I want to say, congr yes, exactly. <laughs> congratulations, Nick. Thank you. Um, regarding the JEDI um, emphasis, I'm, I'm really excited about the developments on the national level. And uh, I think it would be great to have a, you know, I know we have a, um, you know, half as much time at our meetings now, but uh, if, if we could have room for a JEDI um, update and um, tie in to, to what you just presented, uh, that would be great for the next meeting. And maybe that would help uh, round out the agenda so you don't have to, uh, I, I assume you, you will not be at the next meeting, is that right? I could be there, but the, the, the issue will be the coordination and effort in between the meetings and right. the, the meetings Got together it. is there, yeah, I don't know who's gonna take that role. I'd, I'd certainly be happy to coordinate for the, the JEDI items. Okay, thank you. 
So I just wanted to add to Nick's summary of AB 1066. And uh, yes, I think it's very encouraging that our name is being thrown out there for as experts for looking at how to uh, organize a monitoring program uh, for freshwater uh, beaches. I did want to mention that uh, the task that we're given uh, in the current language of the text is a recommendation to the water board on how to define really what the scope of the monitoring would be, because as Nick mentioned, you know, depending on what we define by and what we're, we're calling high use freshwater beaches, what do we mean by high use and be a little bit more thoughtful than, than the, the spitball that happened when AB 411 was, was uh, um, adopted. Not that it hasn't served us well, because <laughs> I think it has. <laughs> but um, I'm but, starting to uh, I'm, I'm I'm starting to get offended here, Karen. So watch out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a hard time believing you get offended by anything, Mark. But at any rate, <laughs> um, uh, you know, taking lessons that we learned from the beach monitoring, what has worked well, uh, and uh, translating that into freshwater is going to be a big challenge. And so we are certainly uh, advocating for enough resources for the council to do a, a thorough job of this task so that when the funds come in for the monitoring and uh, we have a recommendation to the board for what that looks like, it's well thought out and, um, and justifiable and uh, really shows what the council can do with the with the expertise we've convened both at the council level and then at the work group level. So just wanted to kind of emphasize that this is a really good opportunity for us to, to shine. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Well, in the sake of time, and we are on a shortened, um, a shortened time frame of going from 930 to 1230, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to our next item. Um, Josh, I believe you should be able to take control at this point. Uh, Josh Steele from Squirp will be yep. presenting on the actions of the wastewater based epidemiology subcommittee over the last quarter. So with that, feel free to take it away, Josh. Thank you. Okay, can everybody see the uh, slides? Yes. Excellent. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Josh Steele, I'm from Squirp, and I'm going to uh, give you guys an update on the wastewater-based epidemiology subcommittee uh, and what we've been up to. Uh, and so for, for just to remind you, uh, for background, we, uh, the wastewater community in California has been uh, very active in uh, wastewater-based epidemiology and monitoring, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know of more than 30 uh, treatment plants that have been monitoring for um, at least six months and some have been monitoring since last February. So they have well over a year of uh, data that they've been collecting. And we felt there was an opportunity, you all felt there was an opportunity to extend the value of this data. Not all of this data is being used for management decisions. Uh, and there are some applications uh, that we could identify to uh, maybe make this data more, more valuable to the public. Uh, and so the California Water Quality Monitoring Council established uh, this uh, wastewater-based epidemiology committee, including uh, folks from the public health sec uh, regulatory side, the uh, water board regulatory side, the uh, wastewater uh, community, and the research community. So we also identified uh, three main focus areas for the committee. Uh, the first one was uh, just to sort of uh, assess the data quality, both in terms of uh, what data is being collected uh, and uh, how confident we are on that data, uh, as well as uh, the sensitivity and reproducibility of those methods and that data across facilities and, and over time. Um, the next focus area was what we termed data flow, which means um, are they collecting the necessary parameters uh, that we could use them in other ways, uh, in ways to extend their, their benefit? And then are they being shared? Are they being accessible and, and useful uh, in, ways, in ways that could be used for, uh, for the public? And then finally, just uh, to identify any interpretational guidance um, that we could offer. So uh, not only um, 
in terms of what it could be used for in different applications, uh, outbreak response or, or something like that, but also what are the limitations? What can the data tell you and what can't it do compared to other data streams uh, about the, especially about uh, the COVID-19 uh, data itself. Okay, so what we've been up to are two main things. Uh, the first one was we've conducted a survey uh, of wastewater treatment plants and uh, laboratories, uh, just both to find out who's conducting the sampling and how they've been analyzing the samples. Um, and specifically, we wanted to look at differences in methods uh, for collection and, and analysis and how these differences varied over time and, and across plants. Uh, and the second activity we've been up to is uh, to sort of uh, identify use cases and prioritize the ones that have the most societal value, as well as the least, the, the lowest barriers to use and adoption. Um, and then we're sort of gonna combine these and see with our understanding of the methodologies and the data, which of these we could uh, identify as the ones that are the, the best uh, approach for uh, these use cases moving forward, the best ones to choose combined with what we know about the data. So I'm gonna go over these in more detail. The first one, the uh, survey. We conducted a survey of the wastewater treatment plants with the help from CASA, uh, reaching out to them and CWEA as well. Uh, and we've, we've uh, received responses from more than, uh, from about 29 treatment plants. Uh, they told us both when they started and when they either stopped or planned to stop collecting. Uh, we also asked them about the methods for uh, sample collection, and we also asked them about their laboratory analysis, whether they do it in-house or they send it out to other laboratories. And then we reached out to those laboratories. Uh, and so we've, we've gotten most of the laboratories that have been doing the analysis have also uh, responded to our survey at this point. And so the plan is to use this data to inform the aspects of uh, method variations that will affect the usability, what we can what we can use the data for, and it will also sort of start to help us. The, the final thing we asked them was, uh, are they making the data public? Would they be willing to share the data? And where is it going? Who are they sharing it with? And so those are sort of the three goals of the survey. Uh, to give you a really brief summary of what we found so far, uh, and it is still ongoing, we're still reaching out to more. Um, we found that they, the sampling collection methods are relatively similar across facilities. Most people are doing similar things, collecting influent uh, or collecting influent and sludge and how they're treating the samples and all of that is very similar. Uh, the sample processing methods within each facility have remained consistent over time. So uh, for instance, uh, if uh, LA County San has they have been collecting and processing their samples the same way during their whole data set. Uh, however, different facilities and different laboratories do use different methods. So while they're, they're staying consistent within facilities, different facilities are, are using different ways of analyzing and processing the samples. So that's where the differences lie. Uh, we have a few other, like I said, we asked a few other questions as well that relate to data flow and interpretation. And so um, I'll go over some of the other interesting responses we got. Um, the good news is, or one of the really good responses that we were happy about is that the most treatment plants said they're willing to continue collecting. Many of them have been collecting for a year already. Um, and a uh, few are, have committed already to continue collecting until uh, summer, June of 2022. Uh, and a, a number of them have said, well, we're committed to collecting till this summer, but we're willing to continue if there's, if there's value, if people are used to find the data useful or there's funding available. Uh, we also asked about laboratory capacity. Could, are the labs just swamped or can they handle more samples if they needed to? And most of them have additional capacity available. Um, and many of the laboratories have started processing for uh, SARS uh, coronavirus 2 variants, which uh, as you all know, is something everyone's very worried about. Um, however, everyone's doing that in their own way. No one's really settled on a, a standard way to do that either. Um, and roughly a third of the facilities have samples that have been archived that we could go back and assess uh, either to compare methods or across. So we found out quite a bit of information so far and we're still getting more responses. <clears throat> Excuse me. So our next steps. Uh, 
we're going to continue to flesh out the survey. We ha have identified about 15 more facilities that we that we know are sampling that we would like to get their responses, and we're and we're continue to work on that with the help of CASA uh, and CWEA. Um, we're also going to uh, sort of try and look at how these sample processing differences may affect the results looking in the literature and looking at studies that have examined methodological differences and comparing, um, comparing those and seeing where the limitations lie. And then finally, to uh, determine how the method uh, differences will impact uh, the different use cases we've identified. Um, the committee has identified quite a few, more than a dozen, uh, and some processing methodology will have a bigger impact on what we wanna do or what those use cases are than others. So now I'm gonna transition to the use cases themselves, uh, our second activity, where we prioritized uh, which ones we think had the most, be the, the most societal value, the biggest benefit we could get, and then the lowest barriers to adoption. They're the uh, least difficult to, to do. So we identified three main classes of use cases. Um, the very first one and the, the largest one was to support uh, present day public health warning systems. The second one, uh, and so that would be something as an example, uh, looking to uh, track new outbreaks or new increases in, in coronavirus in the, in the wastewater. Second is to conduct retrospective evaluations to learn about management effectiveness. So that would be going into those archives or looking at the uh, data that has already been collected and see, well, if one area, uh, if there was a management uh, choice that was made, uh, lockdown or something, how did that affect what we see in that data? Uh, and then uh, to plan for how we can use wastewater based, wastewater based epidemiology to inform public health uh, uses in the future, outbreak management or other uses. So our approach to prioritize these was to make our list of use cases in each class and identify uh, the barriers for each and rank the uh, potential societal value against the strength of the barriers. So if you imagine uh, a, you know, a, a graph and you have the, on the x-axis you'd have uh, societal value and on the y-axis you'd have strength of barriers, um, you'd want the one uh, with the, so if the value, as the value goes up and the barriers go down, that upper right quadrant is the one you would want to choose uh, to be your best choice to do first. So some of the ones we identified, um, <clears throat> supporting present public health warning systems, uh, as I said, was the largest. It had multiple categories. You can see, I'm not gonna go through all of them here, but you can see them. It's everything from uh, facility level tracking or variant tracking to um, even just enhancing public health communication uh, or geographic comparisons. Barriers I talked about, what do we mean by barriers? Uh, both technical limitations, um, impl implementation concerns, some uh, basically educating people on what the data means and how they can apply it, uh, and even the ethics of the data collection, especially when you start getting into smaller and smaller areas that uh, the ethics of uh, getting data that might be traced back to people start to come into play. Uh, and then finally, of course, funding and capacity limitations. Okay, so what did we find? We found three main use cases that we, that we thought had the highest uh, societal benefit and the lowest barriers. And those were uh, tracking changes in occurrence, uh, in SARS coronavirus occurrence as the individual testing declines. Um, and also uh, secondly, right next to it was confirmation that that occurrence remains low. So just tracking it as, um, as we start opening back up that we don't see in uh, that we see everything stay nice and low in the uh, coronavirus uh, in wastewater, as well as early warning in, for an uptick in occurrence, so an early warning in an outbreak. One additional use case was voted as having very high societal value, but it has larger technical uh, barriers and interpretational barriers, and that's the SARS coronavirus uh, to variant tracking. Very important, but also the science is not quite as uh, developed on how we could do that in wastewater. So lots of people are trying lots of ideas, but it's not there yet. Uh, as far as our barriers go, we identified two 
uh, main barriers across all use cases, which is that we don't have standardization of methods yet. And there is not a great understanding of the relationship of SARS coronavirus in wastewater to occurrence in the population. Um, one barrier that was critical to the top use cases we identified, that was the uh, measuring the uh, confirming that it's low uh, and measuring upticks uh, and uh, sort of maintain, seeing that the uh, that the coronavirus stays steady in the wastewater is sensitivity. That tracking this testing and as virus levels ideally continue to decline, uh, the method sensitivity becomes more and more important. Uh, as you have fewer virus particles to capture, you need a more sensitive method to see them. This is also critical when you start moving into smaller areas, smaller sewer sheds or smaller facilities. So our next steps on the use cases is, uh, again, these were just our, our sort of first discussion of prioritization. So we need to uh, make sure that these are the use cases that, uh, that, we, that we agreed upon are the ones that we really think are the ones that, we'll, uh, that, are, that the subcommittee should focus on helping to improve. Uh, and we're going to examine the barriers in more detail and see what we can contribute to uh, reducing those barriers or improving uh, the data that would lead to these use cases. Uh, and then of course, uh, discuss whether we should sort of improve this prioritization survey, expand it, who else we should talk to about it. Thank you. Great, thanks, Josh. Are there any questions for Josh or, or Steve? Do you have anything to, to fill in? Well, I'll just say that all of that is the result of um, this group has been in existence for six weeks. Yeah. So I think, you know, kind of looking at the big picture, it's it's a committee that has the potential to be effective. And in fact, one of the things that we're focusing our next meeting on, which is on Monday, is given how some of the top use cases that people identified are uh, what happens kind of when you get to the low concentrations, when the testing centers start to close down or people stop going to do testing and you still want to track where things are or when there's a blip up when those tracking systems are in place, you really need to focus on sensitivity. And with all the variations in methodologies that are going on, um, there's a real opportunity for us to help um, identify uh, what are the things that people should do differently if they would like to be able to capture those low ends. So I think there's a real role here for the council to help with that, bringing together a nice combination of scientists and health departments and the people at the sanitation districts who are implementing the, uh, the wastewater-based epidemiology. Great, thanks, Steve. Any questions? Uh, Mark, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah um, uh, great presentation. That was really helpful. And I had no idea you guys were only meeting that shorter period of time. So very impressive. Um, so on the public health side, um, you know, we, we had obviously been talking about a lot of related public health issues. Um, I think Steve, you just, you just talked about one that Josh also brought up, which is when the incidence goes down really far, like what we're seeing in most of the state right now. Um, the other, the other factor coming into play that I haven't really heard too many people talking about on an application here, and it might be very difficult, so I'm not saying it, it's easy, um, would be um, how we're seeing variability um, in, in, um, based on a vaccination rate within the, within the, um, within the sewer shed. And, and I, think, I think that's becoming obviously a hotter and hotter topic as we're, we're reaching um, higher percentage of vaccination um, rates. Um, so I, I'm not sure how to look at that. I know there's already sort of been a little bit of a struggle, maybe hopefully some breakthrough on um, really working on, you know, the work that you're doing and looking at incidents in closer to real time rather than, you know, doing all this sort of hind casting sort of stuff. So anyways, that's, that was just a thought. I, I was just wondering what, what you and Josh thought about that. Well, I, I think you're right on the money. I mean, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that right now, all of the, the wastewater 
processing um, is very helpful right now. Um, it, it essentially serves as confirmation. But a lot of the uses and the things that you're talking about is like trying to understand as the vaccination rate goes up, or how well does the population level occurrence go down? Uh, it's going to be harder and harder to do through the testing of individuals because fewer and fewer individuals are getting tested. As somebody who has been vaccinated, I'm not going to go get, get tested anymore, um, but it's possible that I have it. The wastewater-based epidemiology now becomes potentially even more advantageous. But in order to take advantage of that potential, you have to have sensitive methods. And so right now, where all the wastewater facilities are staying within constant methods, which is good because you, you, know, you, you wanna make sure that you have a continuous stream. If those methods aren't sensitive enough, you'll lose the value at the lower end. And when we've looked at the method variations across facilities, um, one of the things that the group talked about last time is that there are multiple orders of magnitude differences in sensitivity based upon the, some of the methodological differences. And so one of the things that we're now working on is helping to identify for the utilities or even for the laboratories um, that are processing their samples, uh, where you have the greatest loss in sensitivity and maybe how you want to start to create a parallel uh, data stream now with more sensitive methods. So you don't lose the history of what you've done, but you start to create a, a new data stream that would allow you to continue your data record when the, when the um, counts get low or lower. Yeah, tough one. All right. Thanks, Steve. Any other questions for Josh or Steve? And I, I would add that uh, Peter's on the committee too. So I don't know whether Peter, you want to add any thoughts? I, I think that the presentation that um, Josh gave and, and your follow up comments are, were, were spot on. Yeah. It's been, I, I, uh, um, as you said, it's been six weeks and it's been moving really fast, but uh, it's kind of been an exciting uh, group of meetings to listen to because there's been so much discussion and people with ideas. One, one follow-up for all of you, Peter, Steve, and Josh. It, it have, and really this is, I guess, for, for Karen as well. Have things improved? Uh, you know, I know working with um, CDPH and, and, and making sure um, you know, I mean, are they starting to value this information more in, in any way? I mean, it, it'd be good to sort of get an update on on that as part of this, since it's so relevant. Uh, I can yeah. get, we, we have three people from the public health community um, on the committee. And so they're the ones who are helping to drive what would be most valuable. And so while we had a vote amongst everybody on the committee about the relative value of different uses, uh, it was the discussion with them about the uncertainty in their on in their existing data streams about what happens at the low end that probably swayed the committee to to move in this focused direction. Okay. And Karen, you're going to say add. Yeah, I'll just add um, from sort of the water board's perspective. Um, you almost. Uh, uh, they have been very engaged in seeking additional funding through the CDC, the ELC grants, um, not completely successfully, uh, but they have definitely taken a lead role from the state's side of, um, of things. I think the biggest challenge we have now is how to make sure that we can make the data on both the case side and the uh, the wastewater epidemiology side available and and uh, the the barrier that uh, Josh mentioned, which is the you know the confidentiality of data, has been an issue that has that we've run up against. But in terms of their engagement, I think um, I can certainly say that they have taken a lead role and really um, uh, put some good people. On, um, on the work and, and on our committee as well. So it's been very encouraging. Karen, has there been any, any discussion on the, the pending legislation to make that data more available? Um, I have, I, 
I haven't had any specific conversations to date yet. I'm not, I, I guess I'll just admit ignorance on that front. I didnn't realize that there was. Yeah. I, a, I was legislation. just, I was just made aware of it. Um, on Monday and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll I, go ahead to next, to something else, but I'll, I'll try to find the bill number. Maybe I can find it real quick. That'd be helpful. Yeah, Mark, yeah, that'd be please, great. Yeah, please S send another one. SB, yeah. SB 744. SB 744. Okay. I will make note of that. Yeah. And actually it came roundabout from Claire. So it came from your house. <laughs> yeah, so Karen, maybe <laughs> well, you can Claire send has been taking points. Yep. Go ahead, Steve. I was going to say, maybe you can send that to me so I can bring it to the attention of the committee when they meet next Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's pretty. It's pretty simple, Steve. So it'd be, yeah, I'd really be interested to hear what the committee thinks. That'd be that'd be great. And now's the time to sort of make your voice heard. Great. Well, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Steve. Uh, sake of time, I'll go ahead and, and move forward. But great work so far, and looking forward to see what comes out of the subcommittee. All right, on to item number five. Um, Monitoring Council governance update. Um, so uh, as a reminder, we we created a subcommittee at the February 11th meeting to um, to look at our the 2014 governance document of the council um, and look at making key updates in light of our new MOU and just the new state of of affairs with the, the council and strategy, how the, the work groups with AB 1755 in mind, just to, just to make it more in line with the current state of the council. Um, the subcommittee was made up of uh, the co-chairs, uh, Mark and Karen, as well as, um, as Jared and um, Evelyn uh, Wendell, uh, a, who's a work group chair for the Safety Drink website, uh, sorry, Safety Drink work group. Um, we met several times over last quarter and discussed key updates uh, for review and approval by the Monitoring Council at large. Uh, in the beginning of April, I put together a summary of the updates that, that we were proposing, along with a red line and clean version of the governance document uh, to get some early review and feedback. Um, there was some uh, some limited feedback provided to me directly, um, and I've highlighted those, those key topics for discussion today, and I also identified those in the summary document. I uh, hope that you all had a chance to review the summary document and are familiar with this so that we can take full advantage of the 20 minutes a lot of this item um, and hopefully uh, get to an approval piece. But I wanted to start off with the two, two main topics that... Um, were identified as things that wanted to be discussed at the council level. Um, the first was uh, the removal of the list of entities under the council member seats. So in the old previous count, uh, governance document, it identified the 10 seats and underneath each seat, it also had some examples of entities that could fulfill that role or the current entities that are in, were in place uh, for that role. Uh, we, Jared, as, can I? I mean, Nick, can I add one thing? Because I, I think it's important for for the group to know that we all got together saying, "Look, we really want to simplify this thing." Um, you know, it, it was really you know, it, it reminded me of my NGO days, and and it, you know, and, and bylaws gone awry. Um, you know, from the standpoint of the degree of complexity, and so it, I just want to let everybody know that was sort of you know, the mindset going into this, which is like, if you don't, if you don't have to hold yourself legally accountable to something, but just give yourself, allow the flexibility, that, that was really the mindset. Cause I, I think it's just important, Nick, as you, as you go through these proposed updates that, that people understand sort of where we were coming from and, and how we were looking at this exercise. That's all. No, I, I appreciate that, Mark. I, I did try to write that up in, in summary, but it, it's worth stating again here that, yes, we were looking for simplicity and to not overcomplicate or tie our hands unnecessarily. And um, that was really the goal was to to recognize that the important pieces of it, but eliminate anything that just was unnecessarily detailed. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I'll let Jared kind of speak more on this, but there was some concern about uh, not specifically more memorializing entities like CASA, CASQA, Aqua, 
um, with uh, for representation of those particular uh, sectors that are represented under those council seats uh, with the idea that without them being named either here or somewhere else specifically, there would be no way to hold them accountable to participate in the future if uh, it, in the event of council member turnover. Uh, Jared, feel free to, to, to jump in here uh, to express um, this item further and um, sure <clears throat> no it was and it was just a technical comment um, I completely understand and appreciate the efficiency you're going for in simplifying it and it, I just wanted to make sure if we have a governance document uh, or some kind of bylaws or somewhere else where those entities removed are enshrined I just wanted to make sure it wasn't completely lost in our materials and um and I think when we had talked about it in our March meeting, um, you seem to be understanding of the concern, at least for some of the regulated community sectors with these entities. But I just thought having them at not removing them from, from those parts would maybe be the way to go. Even though it's not traditional for a governance document like this, it should be somewhere else. But if, if this is where it's been memorialized in lieu of creating another document, it might be good to retain it there on that one. Um, do you want to move to the other one too, or do you want to wait on this one or, you know, talk I just to want you? to see, I want to, I wanted to pause before moving on, um, uh, to get, get feedback from other council members where they thought it was in, in, in important. Go ahead, Grant. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, Nick, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I only speaking on behalf of the, um, uh, regulated stormwater community. Um, I don't, I don't have an issue with removing Casqua, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not representing Casqua on this body, uh, and Casqua didn't have a role in, um, in, in my taking a, a, a position on, on this council. So I, I mean, well, you know, obviously, uh, both Brian and I, Brian Lawrenson and I coordinate very closely with Casqua. Um, I, I don't see, um, you know, my, my seat on the council as having a direct. Uh, relationship to CASQA, but that, but that's obviously open to debate, I guess. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a fair point. I think that um, those entities were, were named and, and likewise, the other ones, including the state representative ones were to make sure that whoever was seated in those positions had a direct link as a, as a way to communicate with those larger groups, they, like they're members of those groups to communicate the information that the council's doing, the, the products of the work groups, they had a broader forum, uh, recognizing that it's really difficult to represent anything on a statewide level, um, especially across different um, a state like ours, where you, you, you're not necessarily, you can't, you're not necessarily speaking for CASQA. Jared doesn't speak for CASQA, although he has a line into um, to the leadership there. Um, so I think it was really just a recognition that these are agencies that have a broad membership statewide that should be coordinated with um, via the, the, the membership seat um, and have a direct line of communication as a representative. So we, they take the information from the council and make sure they um, discuss it on a broader scale to make sure that there's, um, there's communication there and coordination there. Nick, is it um, listed anywhere else, these entities that were removed out? Not directly, no. No, I mean, just, I mean, there's the logos that you mentioned as, as participating agencies or coordinated entities. Um, but it's really been a more of a recruitment based on um, showing that we have, you know, value to it's valuable for this for a council member to sit on the seat and because you know if if you're representing uh if you're filling this seat you're likely are a member of one of these larger statewide um organizations um the potw one was the with, with casa was a unique one where casa and adam link did um provide direct endorsement for a um, council member seat, but uh, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I understand um, 
the kind of reasoning of removing these potentially. But I think that what it does do though, um, by using cats or casca or aqua, um, it does, you know, kind of set up what you're looking for from participation and involvement. And I, I think it sets a little bit of a sort of tone for it as a statewide uh, council um, that's trying to represent as best as possible statewide perspectives. Um, and I think that's something that, um, I don't know, this is just my two cents on it, not, not my CASCA perspective necessarily. Um, that's a thing I think we all struggle with in our regions is some of that statewide um, perspective and, you know, bringing the minds together across the state on it. So anyway, it, it's just one of those nuanced points <laughs> um, of uh, that, you know, might help uh, reinforce that kind of statewide uh, perspective. Yeah, I appreciate that, Brian. Um, I don't know if there's any sort of um, alternative uh, suggestions if we did remove it from the council member seats, maybe under the membership piece where it's, go ahead. I was gonna say where we are. I was just gonna suggest we have um, board or council member expectations document that mm -hmm. speaks to the expectation that council members are representing a sector and they're creating a two-way communication between the council and their particular sector. So I think we have it. There may be a need to bolster that and make sure that we're, you know, for new members, we've got a few new ones now that we probably should sit down and orient to the council expectations um, to make sure we're implementing it. But uh, I think I think we can address Brian's comment through that document and process. Uh, you read my mind. I was just looking at that. And when I was sharing it with Alma and I was, it needs to be updated, but I, that's where I was, that's where I was trying to go. It was like the member in the, in the membership expectations piece that you should be expected to coordinate with the larger entities. So I, um, I appreciate that. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, what Karen said makes a lot of sense. I, I think my main point is really, there's probably other ways to do that, but I think mm -hmm. that emphasis is important. Agreed. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I, I think that would be fine if that document covers it. It was okay. more of just, I didn't want to lose it and then not have it retained somewhere. Okay, thank you. Is there a, a committee just, that's going to be needed for that? Like a subcommittee for the membership doc or? Uh, that's, that's at the end. Uh, well, that'll be a next steps. So we'll okay. see um, if, if it's necessary. But yeah, that yeah is, it, I, I have that highlighted. I was going to say it's the trust Nick to take a shot at it committee. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> I just wanted to give an added perspective that uh, when I first uh, came into the council in 2016, uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, it was understood that what I was saying was not on behalf of my particular agency, but was uh, on behalf of statewide POTWs, which I coordinate through CASA. So um, I asked for the logo to be, you know, changed from LACSD to CASA. So that's how that came about. All right, thanks, Shelley. Well, it sounds like we've, we've got a resolution of that to kind of, to, to leave the proposed updates as is, but look to um, an action item to look to the expectations document as, an, as a place to reemphasize the statewide coordination as a responsibility for the seat, um, for the seats filling those positions. On to the next um, topic um, that was brought to my attention was the addition of new council uh, member seats. Um, uh, as you can see from the updates, we proposed two potential new seats, um, one for public health, uh, with an eye on uh, potentially a CVPH or some other local health agencies um, that can provide a perspective um, in line with things um, that the council does because we lost that piece when um, the division of drinking water came to the, to the water boards. We, you know, that became another water board entity, but there's still several things that public health does that are directly impacted or in line with the, the monitoring that is done um, statewide. So we thought it was important to 
potentially leverage the communication we have now again with CDPH and local health agencies and, and getting a, a voice, a consistent voice on, on the council. Um, the second was uh, the academic sector um, and that to, to be more clear and we can touch on it in the second bullet is, would be to take advantage of universities and um, the, not only the, the researchers at the, the universities and the faculty, but also the students there, the um, both undergrad, postdocs, graduate students and leveraging the work they're doing um, and the funding opportunities there and uh, the listservs there to get um, participation from, from those entities and, and leverage those efforts. Um, things like the CSU system, the UC system, there's CSU Coast, there's WBI, um, WRPI um, from the CSU system, and there's some, some sister ones from the UCU system as well. Um, uh, the comment that I received, it, it was also like I captured it in the updates with, but uh, or the summary piece, Jared uh, and I, I believe Shelly were, um, what's the word, endorsing a third seat for um, water recycling specifically uh, to be represented by, by water reuse. Um, Jared, Shelly, or Jared, it's pretty much yours, but if you want to kind of voice that. Sure. Um, and so I think, you know, specifically this comment was about water reuse, but I know that um, the California Special Districts Association had also met with you um, about having a seat on the council. And I think it just comes from kind of this spirit of optimizing and, and taking advantage of, of groups that want to be involved in what they're specific expertise is much in the same way as having the academic community um, be serving in here uh, in the way that, you know, we already have a scientific chair, but there is something they bring that's unique. I, I think that was where we were coming from. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciated your suggestion, Nick, on a path forward of having water reuse serve as the alternate for CASA or for Aqua, but in effect, that would really result in either of those organizations uh, or, or those seats on the council losing one of their seats to make way for another organization that has a different you know, batch of governing documents, a bunch of different batch of policy priorities, different organizational duties. And, and so it seemed like a, their own distinct seat would to me be much preferred um, when we're at a time when we're creating other seats to really optimize the council. Um, I would respectfully request a reconsideration of of water reuse being afforded the same status as um, the other organ, the other potential new seats that are being created. Um, to me, it might be analogous to how CDPH would have their own seat on the council. Um, we, we wouldn't want them just to be an alternate for the division of drinking water seat. Um, and I think by allowing water reuse and even CSDA a full seat, it would provide the council um, a direct link to vital organizations and in the case of water use, um, they're going to be at the heart of solutions to really major water policy challenges in the state over the next generation. And so in recognition of how water use's involvement would be an asset to the council, uh, that would be very appreciated. And, and having them come on as a full member, I would strongly encourage the council to avail itself of this opportunity uh, to have two organizations that want to be involved to bring their resources to help the council out. Uh, I think that'd be really great and appreciated. Uh, Mark. Well, to, just to address the thinking behind all three um, and Nick to add to what you said, and, and, and this might sound a little counter to what Jared's saying. Um, on the public health side, I think we've seen through the wastewater epi <laughs> how glaring a gap it is to not have someone from CDPH there. And I can tell you right now, we, you know, and this is it will come out very soon, but you know, we, we put together aquaculture um, principles um, and CDPH was critical to putting together those principles. Like there's no way we would have added that component to the aquaculture principles um, that you know, CNRA is sort of spearheaded putting together without the involvement of, of CDPH. So, and so the whole public health component um, uh, from the standpoint, not only not only on the drinking water side, but obviously on um, the food consumption side, um, 
really can't the food consumption side can't be picked up by anybody in this group. And so that that's that I think is a big issue. And we and we've already talked ad nauseum uh, about the importance of CDPH on wastewater epi. When it comes to academia, um, you know, it, it just the university system. We're very lucky in California that we have so many different types of scientists here, and um, and so you have the Squirps and the SFDIs and then Baris and, and and those sorts of folks. But you also have, um, you know, the the academics, and there's there's sort of a a, a difference in the type of research done in academia. Um, in comparison to some of those groups in many areas, not a lot, but in many areas, that's the case. And so, um, plus there's a huge benefit, I think, of getting the university system more engaged in these sorts of things. And that's been an, a, a big challenge on the other end. I struggle with it an awful lot as executive director of the Ocean Protection Council, as well as a member of the Ocean Science Trust, um, in really trying to get the academic community more engaged in meaningful ways. Um, and so I think there's there's the double benefit there um, of doing that. So that there's, you know, there's no board of directors, there's no those sort of other sorts of issues that you can often have um, with these other um, research facilities. And then lastly, on on water reuse, um, and it's not like I'm gonna fall on the my fall on the sword here, but you know, it, it, it it's another example of, of a group that um definitely has a strong point of view, which in this case, I share. I mean, anyone can look at my history and know I pushed as hard on water recycling in the state of California as anybody you know. Um, and I can't imagine, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you, Shelly, at LA County San. I mean, you guys have been a leader on water recycling. Water recycling is a huge part of who you are. It's in your DNA. And so, you know, to say that you're not going to be out there supporting water recycling when that's such a huge part of what you are and such a huge part of what CAS, um, CASA has supported for a long time or uh, other major um, sewage treatment plants, I, I'm just not seeing the additional benefit. Many of the people who are part of water reuse are also part of CASA. There's a great deal of overlap there. Um, and um, you know, I can't imagine us having someone from the POTW community that's not incredibly well-versed in pro water recycling. I just can't see that in this group. Um, and so that's that was the thinking there was that we felt it was it was it was redundant um, uh, in that regard. And um, I'll just leave it at that. And I'm sure other people have comments. Mark, uh, uh, since you, you mentioned me, uh, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I do have a, a large breadth of knowledge and uh, I'm involved in a lot of things in my agency and as well as statewide. Uh, water reuse, uh, it, it would be like comparing stormwater to wastewater. We have two separate uh, seats on the council because you know, there are a lot of uh, entities, uh, publicly owned treatment works that handle both. And so they're well-versed in stormwater as well, but uh, we have them separate because they really are. Um, they're not, se they're not separate in your agency. So that, that's sort of interesting. My, my personal agency, no. But uh, they, within our groups, yeah, I don't work with anyone directly that works on water reuse, not, not even in my, my group. So it's, uh, it is a kind of, a, you know, that's why we have Grant representing stormwater. So it's a similar thing with water reuse. So it, it's, a, it's a really um, separate issue with some overlap, just like I have some um, overlapping interests with, with Grant or with WeTap or with groundwater, um, you know, there, there are a lot of, I mean, we're all dealing with water quality, but it's different aspects. Uh, this is Ray, I'll, I'll pipe thing. in here just, just for a second with a local example in Orange County, we do a lot of water recycling, but it is the Orange County Water District that does that recycling, not the Orange County Sanitation District. Just wanna throw that out there. I'd like to make a suggestion. I, I can't raise my hand because I'm a co-host, I think. I don't have that function, so there you go. Um, what about utilizing the alternate as a way of expanding our 
uh, representation of sectors. So, for example, in the POTW, have a CASA member as the primary and an alternate from water reuse or or somebody with expertise in water reuse so that we use the alternate. And, and my interest is to keep the council a size that is not so unwieldy uh, and difficult to bring together and um, make decisions. Uh, same with the academia seat, having a, a sort of uh, non non academia role for one of the members and an alternate out of academia, something like that. So maybe well and I'll just I'll just say for what it's worth, it hasn't always been easy populating our um, council membership either and making sure that people are attending. So lately we've had a lot of engagement. We do have some seats that tend to be uh, less well represented. Uh, and so keep that in mind as well. It gets a lot more difficult to manage the more seats we have. And uh, Karen, I think you'll see that that varies by sector. So wastewater has always been very active on the council and uh, actively attending meetings and participating in subcommittees. And um, yeah, as far as an alternate, uh, Alma is in CASA. I'm affiliated with a wastewater agency. We work together in very different ways where I'm uh, a scientist involved, you know, very knowledgeable about regional and local monitoring and all the issues that we face with water quality. And um, Alma is, is uh, you know, has a very different um, emphasis that's very helpful um, to, the, you know, just like Jared has been so helpful on the council, uh, Alma will be bringing that same expertise. So uh, it's very different. And um, to lose that in order to gain water reuse would be um, not something that would be beneficial to anyone. Yeah, I think just to maybe flesh out a little bit more what Shelly means is um, she really handles a lot of the technical nuts and bolts of what's being discussed the council level and what I've done with CASA is connected our members to the work groups and to what's happening at the council level, kind of serving as a liaison or facilitating it. But it, I think because I was the alternate, that was the, you know, the impetus for that outreach and engagement. And so if that alternate seat were to be lost to make way for water reuse, then it's the other seats have kind of two members to, to engage how they would like, we would be losing that to retain it. And so again, I, I guess, you know, maybe in the interest so, of time. Oh, I ahead. was just going to suggest let's let's see what the the whole council. I mean, I guess raise your hand if you want water reuse <laughs> and an academia seat. Might as well just, you know, I, I think we're hearing from the vocal members of the council. <laughs> let's hear from the whole council. Right. And before we do that, let's um, I mean, I think that could be captured maybe after the discussion, I mean, and we are short on time, we're going over into our break, but I wanted to give Steve a chance to discuss that he wanted to kind of clarify the difference between the seat he represents with the scientific community versus an, an academic community seat. Um, so, uh, I'll weigh in on all three issues since you're looking for opinions on the Department of Public Health one. I, as vehement as Mark was, I'm even more vehement. We really need that. Uh, <laughs> In terms of my, the comment that's attributed to, to me about the difference, it's actually more of a nomenclature difference. No, you have two issues. One, do you have one a second science to see? But then if you do, um, do you really want to call one academia? You want to call one scientist? It seems odd. Um, science, academics are typically scientists. So um, I think that if you want to move forward with that, just call it two scientist positions and kind of going where Mark went before, informally. Um, agree rather than you know, that, that you're going to put one of them academic or non-academic. Um, so it's really just a nomenclature thing that was my concern on that one. Mm -hmm. On the on the recycling thing, um, I'm I see arguments in both directions. Um, I think that really comes down to how big do you want the council to be. Uh, you can make an argument for why it's different. On the other hand, if the council starts to get too large, you have a problem that way. I, before Nick and Karen, before we, I guess, call for a vote, which I guess is almost 
a big deal in this group anyways. But um, I'm just wondering, you know, how big of a deal, you know, from the standpoint of, you know, what we're not covering because we don't have representation from the water reuse community and the things that obviously hit me, one is receiving water oriented, Shelly. So I'm sure that actually is something you deal with from the standpoint of nutrient discharges to in inland waters um, is obviously a big issue. But the, but the, and the other, the other aspect of that also could be, you know, now there's more dis discussion on microplastics, which obviously you're engaged in as well. The, I'm just wondering from the drinking water, our, our drinking water representation here. Um, I, I mean, when I think of monitoring, I mean, are, 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 is there like a big issue we're not dealing with because we don't have a water recycling representation looking at drinking water monitoring? Because I'm, I'm guessing that would be the area you're trying, the gap you're trying to fill that wouldn't be filled otherwise. I, I, I'm just trying to understand that. Andrew, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I guess my thought, I mean, just my thought in general on the whole issue is, yeah, I don't, I don't think we need an, an additional seat for that. I mean, I think, you know, to the point that, uh, you know, that you were making about, you know, if it's, if we were really talking about microplastics, I mean, that's something that, um, well, at least with a little preparation that I could certainly, and my colleagues can certainly um, handle from, from our end. And so, um, if, yeah, if that's your question, then I, you know, I think, I think, you know, we can, we can deal with that with the sort of with the makeup of the, of the council as it is. I will say, I, I, you know, I do agree with the, the, you know, I, I, I agree with Karen in, um, I don't, I don't think the council should expand very much, if at all, um, because, you know, my experience in, you know, in other sort of similar entities is, yeah, once things get too big, it gets unwieldy and, and it's hard to get decisions made and hard to get work done. And so, but I do think having uh, public health, because there are some, there are certain very important aspects of public health that that we in the drinking water um, don't cover that are important to the council. So that's those are my general opinions on you know on the on the discussion. I'll just weigh in briefly as well, and I realize this is probably my agency perspective, but um, in San Diego we really view one water as kind of the the concept we're going forward towards. And in my case, drinking water, wastewater, and recycled water all fall under me. So I'm always thinking of the three of them as, as being so intimately connected that they don't necessarily need to be separated um, by different representation at this point in time. You know, I, um, hearing that, and if, if we already had seats for, or for stormwater and wastewater, then it would seem to be logical to have a seat for the third prong of, of what's under your house, Peter, which would be the water reuse seat. I think I'm fine just moving a call to question and just say, can we thumbs up or thumbs down it? I don't mean to cause any headache or problems and I don't mean to protract this. Um, you know, I think the there's a CEC's panel on recycled water. That type of recycled water monitoring is we're getting our confidence in advanced treatment, direct potable reuse, things like that. Having them on the council, um, the council is supposed to be a public information hub. If, if the public have questions about, is this recycled water safe? You know what's coming into this recycled water? Is there any human waste in this water? Is it really filtered out? It seems like this would be the type of thing the council, it could be a niche the council is designed to fulfill and answer those questions. So that's kind of more of the thought process, but if it's fine, just to call a vote and, and move on, I'm, I'm good with that. And, and just because that a lot of people think that that's, you know, we can serve both roles. They, I just want to let you know, just from an agency perspective, they are such different, uh, a suite of issues, just as Jared just described. And um, you really can't do it justice to have, it, it, it'll either be not well represented on the council as we um, go through these issues, or maybe the issues just won't come up in the council because we don't have that expertise to bring it up. Okay, um, well, we are way over time. Um, I didn't know it was gonna go this this um, deep into discussion, but um, I will, um, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna call for a motion on approval of, of the proposed updates as is. Um, 
and with the with the recommendation that uh, air uh, that the scientific community be identified as academic versus non academic for a nomenclature piece um, that edit will be made um, and do a vote of of sectors. Um, one additional clarifying change that I think was assumed but maybe not clarified was that there's only one vote per sector so it's not like an alternate and a primary you get to vote and get counts twice so it's just one per sector um so i will call for um approval by show of raise of hands if you approve for the uh, governance updates as proposed in the summary and red line and clean versions with the addition of a change in nomenclature for the academic seat to be academic versus non-academic. Um, so all in favor for your, uh, the council members, raise your hands now. I've got seven of the 10. Um, and Terry raised his hands, although he's not voting. So, um, so seven out of nine. So the the updates um, are approved as. Did you get mine? Did you get my raised hand? Because I, I can't okay. actually. Yeah, I, okay. Okay. I got you. Yeah. Thanks. I got you. The thumbs up. I think or something. Um, so, uh, the the updates are approved and will be made official. So thank you and thank you for the discussion. Um, the next steps. I think that we're going to update the web pages to reflect the new nomenclature. We're going to go away from the SB 1070 since it's so outdated and focus on the actual clean water code that establishes the um, council, uh, clean water code 13181. And I'll circle back with some of these just because we are um, behind time, but um, you know, update some other documents, including the theme specific work group development, the expectations. Um, and recruit some new members as well as provide updates to the secretaries. We are behind time. I'm gonna, uh, okay, go ahead, Peter. Oh, your hand's still up from voting, I think. Um, okay, thanks. Um, we had scheduled a, a time to break. Um, we went past that time. Are, are, are people still needing a break? Uh, if you need a break, uh, raise your hand and we can just push back. Okay, well. If you need to get up and go, then get up and go. <laughs> um, with that, uh, as Shelly um, Moore will be giving us a presentation um, on the trash monitoring methods and assessment playbook. And um, she's uh, Shelly Moore from SFVI and the Moore Institute. Shelly, are you there? I am. Great. Thanks, Nick. No, thank you. All right. So you're going to control it. I will, I will change. I will. Uh... Uh, let you know when to change the slide. Go ahead and change the slide. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the trash monitoring uh, playbook for California. Uh, it's been a long uh, process. Um, I'll review basically the purpose of the playbook. I'll just describe some of the methods, talk about um, what we looked at, and then give you some of the, I'm going to give you a little taste of the results that came out of this, and then we'll stop for questions. Um, next slide. So um, in reviewing uh, the purpose of the playbook, we had this uh, stakeholder meeting back in April of 2017, where uh, what I would, I would call trash professionals all got together and talked trash uh, for a couple of days. And the, the goal of the, the meeting was to see what people wanted to learn more about uh, for trash. What were the management questions? What did they want? Um, what information did they want to get out of out of um, uh, this um, process. And one of the things that came up was that a lot of people do uh, methods and do things differently. There's no real consistent way that people look at, at trash. So there's not a lot of compar comparability um, when we, we're talking about trash. Next slide. So some of the common concerns are you know, how, how does my area compare to another area? One of the things we've been talking a lot about with the trash monitoring group is, you know, if, if I'm a, in a particular region, how does my region compare to all of California? Uh, the other thing is uh, the, the main question I get from most of the, the people creating the policy is, 
Uh, how do I know if what I've put in place is, is actually making a difference? Is the trash out there getting better or worse? Um, and these management questions getting translated into scientific questions become really important because uh, we, we know what the management questions is oftentimes, but uh, translating them into scientific questions is, is, is really difficult um, in some cases. So the purpose of the playbook um, is to mostly provide people with uh, the ability to use a method and use it in conjunction with other, other folks and be able to compare their data and answer some of these questions, these scientific questions that are coming from the management questions. Next slide. So in uh, 2017, after this meeting was held, the Ocean Protection Council funded a three-year project to develop a trash monitoring playbook for the state of California. Uh, this um, project was also supported uh, by the State Water Resources Control Board. Next slide. So our approach was to basically test for field uh, methods. And in looking around the state, we, um, we, we knew that there were methods that were actually already being used. Um, so we wanted to test some of the methods that were already being used, as well as a new method, a novel method, um, and develop that method uh, for potential use throughout California. We didn't want to do this in a bubble, so we involved stakeholders, uh, people that participated in that, that or original stakeholder meeting, plus others, uh, the, the technical experts, the trash experts. Um, and we wanted to inv involve other types of people. Because one of the things we wanted to make sure we were doing as we were developing or testing these methods is that these methods were usable by a variety of levels of uh, stakeholders. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we got some uh, to actually participate in the field testing, uh, which was, was, was a really awesome thing. Next slide. So the products coming out of this project are our field testing report. Um, and, and I'll hit a little bit on the results that came out of this, but I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth because I've got a limited uh, amount of time. Um, and the playbook, of course, for trash monitoring methods. We've got a list of those four different methods in the playbook. We've, we've got this, their standard operating procedures, um, information on, on field, um, on going out in the field. We didn't want it to just be, here's the methods. We wanted to give people some ideas about how to prepare and, and, and what some of the things they needed to do to go out into the field, as well as when they get back, what they can do with their data. Um, and again, we wanted it usable by a variety of people. Uh, and then as part of the outreach and training, we've been giving a lot of uh, talks um, and many of you on this, um, in this meeting have, have seen some uh, various iterations of our talks in, in, in just the last couple of months. So next slide. So I'll briefly describe the methods so you uh, get a better understanding of what's in the playbook. Uh, we The three already established methods were methods that were in use by the um, by BASMA up in the Bay Area and by the SMC, the Stormwater Monitoring Coalition here in Southern California. Those three methods were the rapid trash assessment, which was originally developed by the folks at Swamp. It, um, uh, um, and basically what it involves is, is going out there and doing a rapid assessment. We also had a method that's done was done in, in the Bay Area, which looks at volume of trash. The one in Southern California looks at particular items and categorizes them and tallies them. And then again, the novel method that we were, were looking at uh, developing and actually um, have done a lot of work on is the UAS method, the unoccupied aerial system uh, method, which involves uh, flying drones and doing some machine learning on the imagery. Uh, next slide. So just to talk briefly about each method, the visual assessment again is rapid. It, you basically go out to an area, you walk um, uh, the, the area itself, and you give it a number between one and 12, with one being the lowest amount of trash and 12 being the highest. Um, and, and, and then categorizing by whether or not we perceive the trash to be very high versus uh, low. Um, next slide. And I will say um, that all of these methods were performed at a given site, all four methods, so that we can compare, could compare them, and they were all done in streams and rivers. So the volumetric method was, again, developed by BASMA, um, and this actually looked at volume. So how much space did the trash take up in 
the actual assessment area. Um, it it, it uh, made an attempt to uh, categorize the trash based on pathway. Was it coming from homeless encampments? Was it runoff? Was it, was it um, litter? Those kinds of things. Uh, next slide. And then the quantitative method, which was developed um, in Southern California and refined by the SMC, um, where they went out and they actually counted each individual item. So you had different categories at a larger scale. You had things like plastic and metal and glass. And then at a finer scale, they actually would record the number of wrappers, the number of bottles, um, and, and, and break things out by that. Uh, next slide. And then again, the novel uh, UAS method uh, was, was uh, uh, something we, we went out and tried and, and were successful at, at getting some good results on. Um, and this was really great because it enabled us to cover larger areas um, and uh, use less staff time. One of the things that came out of all of looking at all these methods um, and particularly the, the um, the two uh, infield methods where they're actually collecting information on the trash um, was that it takes up a lot of staff time. So resources, they're, they're very resource heavy um, uh, uh, methods. In this case, the, the resources are spent primarily on purchasing the equipment and on, on, the, um, on the computers in the background uh, to do the machine learning, uh, but it actually takes very little staff time to do this. And these, these drones can cover a, a large amount of area. Next slide. So, um, and, and the area is basically determined by the height of the flight. So there were a lot of things that we had to think about when we were looking at the unoccupied, unoccupied aerial systems ranging from how high do we fly um, to get the resolution that we need in order to be able to see the trash, all the way to things like where can we fly? Because there's actually rules out there that prohibit flying in all areas. Uh, next slide. So uh, in the background, after the, the flights were made, there was uh, some software that was used and developed uh, to, um, to analyze those um, images and to count the trash. And we had some help with that and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Next slide. So next slide. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do with the field testing report is, again, I, as I said, we, we did each one of those methods at a given site. So we would go, we would fly the site with the drone and perform all three of those other methods. And we wanted to see how, how accurate they were, how close the measurements were to one another, and how many resources each one of those methods took, and compare those methods uh, to each other. So uh, next slide. This is a matrix of some of the things we were looking to fill in for each one of those methods. Um, again, um, looking at um, how, how likely somebody might want to, um, how likely somebody was to use these. So my monitoring question says I need to go do this method, but I don't have the resources for it. Maybe I need to evaluate my monitoring question. or filling this matrix types of questions. Next slide. So let me give you an example of some of the results. Um, this is something called the extinction curve, essentially. These are five different sites that were walked uh, by the same team. Each team um, kept walking the site until there was no trash found. In most cases, you can see by the second time of, of doing a pass on the site, most of the trash was recovered, um, except in extreme cases where we had large amounts of trash. You can see by the red line, uh, there was well over 500 uh, pieces of trash. And interestingly enough, that is actually the picture that's on the right uh, for site one. Um, and those buckets show you how much trash was by volume at those sites. So there were a large number of items, but a small um, amount of volume at those sites. When you have larger amounts of, of uh, items and, and they're very small, um, you, you have to do more passes to find them. And, and so that's what we got out of this one. Next slide. We also had numer numerous teams go out. We had people from some of the stormwater agencies, and we also had some 
um, nonprofit agencies go out with us and do some assessments. Uh, these assessments, you can see, were relatively comparable. There's differences in the number. Um, numbers, you can see uh, Team A actually is listed twice. What uh, Team A did was they actually collected all the trash, took it back to the lab and counted it again. And you can see that's the, the number 232. The number's probably a little bit high because some of the items were broken up in transport, uh, but you can see uh, some of the differences amongst the teams here. Next slide. One of the things we wanted to do is compare the, rela the relationships between the methods and um, Vasma has done this too, um, in, in particular with this uh, relationship here where they looked at the volume versus that visual score. And what we found is there is pretty high correlation between uh, volume and the visual score. Some of the other methods, uh, not so much a uh, high relationship as you can imagine, the tally um, method didn't um, measure as well. Uh, with the qualitative score. And a lot of that has to do, again, with the size of the, of the uh, trash in the area. Next slide. So just to go over a little bit about the drone stuff, um, mostly because it's kind of cool and, and um, it, was, it was really fun to look at. Uh, this is actually an image that was collected by the drone. And you can see that each one of those uh, squares are uh, what uh, identifies a piece of trash in the frame. So you can see there are a number of, of, of pieces of trash in this particular area. Next slide. So if we zoom in on one area, go ahead and look at the, the um, boxes around the, the pieces of trash, we can actually identify some of those as um, what they are. Um, you can see a, to a toy there, a wrapper. There's, a wa there's some water bottles there as well. Next slide. So one of the things we wanted to do was look at um, the UAS method versus the tally method. And so what, what, what uh, this graph represents is if we identify the trash using UAS method and we don't, uh, and, and we count all the trash there regardless of size, um, or type um, what we would get. There's a, there's a pretty large difference between the true number um, using the tally, tally method versus the uh, UAS uh, number using UAS. If we remove the small pieces, the relationship gets a little bit closer, the number gets a little bit closer. And if we remove pieces and paper, it gets even closer than that. So the UAS method is great for identifying larger pieces of trash, not so much for the smaller pieces. Um, next slide. One of the things I alluded to with the uh, with with uh, previously was that we had some relationships that we developed during this project. One of the things we developed in, kind of at the same time we were doing uh, this project was the uh, Department of Public Health, um, California Department of Public Health, uh, had us develop a tobacco product waste method, and it's 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 similar in concept to what we've done here for the trash uh, monitoring playbook. Uh, we also uh, had a relationship with a grad student at the University of um, actually Loyola in Chicago. Um, and this uh, student actually performed the methods in Chicago um, and in, in rivers um, near Chicago. And we've, we've got that data uh, to compare as well. We had relationships with some supercomputing folks. Um, Connecticut and or Oracle provided us some of the muscle we needed in order to perform the machine learning, um, and we're grateful for that. We also had another project, the Escape Escaped Trash Assessment Product Protocol uh, with the US EPA, where we performed their method at the same time at a subset that we perform, a subset of sites that we perform these other methods. Uh, next slide. So what does the playbook in include? I alluded to this a little bit before. Um, we talk a lot about the standard operating procedures for the methods themselves, but we also give some other considerations when we're going out and doing some field sampling. We also wanna make sure that people take into account some quality assurance, um, making sure that they're doing field audits and, and, and checking um, a subset of the sites in order to make sure that the uh, collection of the data is consistent. Uh, we, um, again, are, um, we include some training, some common vocabulary, and um, one of the things that came out of uh, doing all this work was 
how do you make comparisons between volume assessments and something like the tally assessment? Well, what we are also recommending is that the best way of doing some of these um, measurements is by getting an amount per unit volume, um, per unit area um, where we can, so we can make comparisons amongst um, area um, amongst uh, sites. Next uh, slide. And um, we also provide something that's really important, particularly if you want to compare your data to some someone else's data, um, some st data standardization and, and capture methodologies um, for any of the methods that are in there. Um, again, standard operating procedures. So let me describe how we basically put the methods into the playbook. We used a tiered method approach. Next slide. And this is, this is the approach that we use. So tier one is that high level visual assessment, qualitative assessment, where you're basically categorizing a site by low, moderate, high, and very high. Underneath that, we've got the UAS. And, and part of the, the goal with the, the flying of the drone was to identify items as either plastic or not plastic. Um, then farther down, we've got the volume and we had actually categorized um, the items into different uh, high level categories. What we found was that um, doing a sort uh, pathway assessment was was pretty difficult. Um, so we we also categorized uh, the items based on their types at, at a high level. And then tier four with the tally, uh, you can see that each one of those higher higher level categories is actually broken down into finer um, items uh, list a finer list of items. Next slide. Uh, go ahead, click through this. So you can see um, we have got a list of questions that um, each one of those tiers might address. Um, and we've listed those in the handbook as well. Next slide. So how did everything break down in the matrix? This is how we broke it down. You can see that the tally method by far um, uh, consumes the, the highest amount of resources. Uh, the, the visual assessment, the, the least, um, and you can see the differences in accuracy and precision as we measured out in the field. Next slide. One of the other things that we did was we, uh, we, we created a mobile application. Uh, the mobile application was used um, to um, kind of uh, standardize the way people collected the visual data. Visual data is very subjective. So, and again, uh, BASMA um, had uh, uh, refined the original uh, method um, that was developed, and they had a list of how you would categorize each one of those, each, each um, a site based on these different um, uh, statements. We took those statements, turned them into questions. When you fill the information in on the, on the phone application, uh, the phone application actually takes all of your answers to the questions, and it will give you a recommended um, uh, number uh, for a given site uh, based on the answers to these questions that you came up with. So it, it actually tries to make the, the answers and the, the subjective um, uh, 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 qualifications that you have on, the, on a site, and it, it, it attempts to make, make those a little more consistent by by using this application. This application is available to anybody who wants to use it. Um, and again, um, it does require uh, Esri's uh, survey one, two, three. Next slide. So um, to conclude, um, we, we, we know that size of trash matters for all the methods. Um, again, as the matrix indicated, the uh, resources that are needed vary by uh, method as well. Um, relationships can be used in some cases, particularly in that volume uh, versus um, um, uh, visual assessment, qual qualitative assessment. Um, we recommend that trash density as a metric uh, be used because it facilitates uh, comparability amongst the different methods. And one of the things that we really found was, and, and we saw in that one graph, where um, we had people go out, there were differences in the number, those numbers, and we have some, some uh, 
graphics in the field testing report are actually closer together the more training that that people um, receive. So training is extremely uh, critical for repeatability. One of the questions we constantly get asked is for people to, from people is, so which method is best? Well, what, what we would tell them is that there isn't a best method. It's all dependent upon what your, um, your monitoring questions are as far as which uh, question or, or which method you would use. Again, um, if, if, to give you that example of if you go out and, and you have a monitoring question in mind and you see that in order to answer that monitoring question, the resources are, are too much, you can either find the, the resources to pay for that um, method or you can revise your question based on that. There isn't a, a best method. Uh, next question, or next uh, slide. So that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, please let me know. I would challenge you uh, with, um, with thinking about a few things. Um, I'll end with this. Um, this is the start of a playbook for California for trash monitoring methods. It only covers streams and rivers. Um, we wanna build upon this. Uh, there's, there's certainly other environmental areas that we would like to cover and add to this playbook. I would challenge you as council members to uh, help us by letting people know about this playbook um, and also passing along any funding opportunities for building upon this. And I wanted to let you know that as uh, co-chair of the Trash Monitoring uh, Work Group, we have three subcommittees. We have the Citizen Science Subcommittee, the um, recently changed um, uh, in name, Homeless Encampments to Encampments. It's simply the Encampment Subcommittee now um, and the Data Management uh, Subcommittee. Um, we're all working together uh, to, um, to um, uh, come up with some ideas. We had a brainstorming session the other day uh, for getting some funding and, um, and move, moving to, to forward this document and creating some more information from it. That's it. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Shelly. Great presentation. I got a couple of questions. Uh, Terry, let's start with you. Yeah, um, uh, Shelly, I think you might have answered it. I, I was wondering about um, the applicability to beach monitoring, and you just said it doesn't apply uh, yet and that you're interested in it. I, I noticed that um, uh, NOAA has just refined their beach monitoring, uh, I guess what you would call the tally system, and um, it looks pretty good to me. So um, I'd encourage you to look at that. Yes. Um, and, and we've been working with uh, Sherry Lippiet and, and keeping uh, in, uh, as, actually you can see that last slide is, there's a picture of Sherry there. She went out in the field with us when we were working on the, the, um, the uh, UAS method. So um, definitely we'll keep an eye on that. Ray. Uh, yeah, gr uh, great presentation. Uh, I saw the one slide that said the visual method was uh, low to medium, as was the UAS, but it appeared from the presentation that the UAS method had the ability to better identify pieces of trash, or I was just curious about that, the comparison between those two. Yeah, so the, the, um, the UAS method, um, it's, you can identify larger pieces of trash. Um, we found in this particular um, instance where we're looking at all trash that um, we identified, um, I think the, the, um, the numbers was, we could identify plastic versus not plastic with about 50% 50, 50 accuracy. In that project that I was talking about um, with the tobacco waste, um, the, um, the ability to identify tobacco waste um, goes up to over 90%. So there is some, um, some work that still needs to be done in the machine learning realm. And I'm, I apologize, the street sweeper is right in front of my house right now, stopped. So um, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I can't plan these things. Um, anyway, uh, we're working on refining the machine learning stuff um, to make it uh, uh, better. Uh, the, obviously the more um, images you have for training, the better the um, algorithm works. Um, so we're, we're constantly adding more to it. Um, and you're right. The, the other thing is that um, the ability to identify trash has to do with how high you're flying the drone as well. And 
if you're flying really high, you can cover a larger area, but you have less, um, you have less resolution. If you fly lower, you can't cover as much area because there's battery uh, life um, uh, things you have to think about within the drone, um, but you'll get better resolution. So that's why we put that in the low to medium uh, category. The visual assessment we put in the uh, low to medium category because it's just that it's a very subjective measurement. And um, as you're walking the site, there, there, you're not you're not necessarily seeing all the small items that you would see with the tally method, or even the the volume method. Great question. <clears throat> okay, next, I have a well after well right before Grant. Sorry, uh, Michelle, she couldn't figure out how to raise her hand. So yeah, sorry wondering. about that. You'd think I would know, but a technology <laughs> always fails me at Sears. Uh, but Shelly, I really love this presentation. I had a question sort of building upon um, the previous one on the UAS method. And so I wanted to make sure I understood during your presentation, it seemed that the algorithm itself, the machine learning approach was trash, trash versus non-trash, but then you were also stating it could specify further whether it was plastic or not plastic. Is that correct? That's That was the goal um, in, the, in the end. Um, uh, we, we, we were looking primarily at trash versus not trash, but uh, the goal has been to do plastic versus non-plastic. And we're, 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 we're getting closer. Um, I think um, we've talked about looking at some multispectral uh, cameras and, and other methods for uh, seeing if we could get better accuracy with that. Oh, perfect. And I had one follow-up question. Are you still continuing going out, taking the drone in the field? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the drone has been going out in the field. Um, it's doing other types of work as well. Um, but we are still working on adding to the imagery library so that we can um, we can actually build upon it. And, and, and as I said, the more images you have, um, the, the better the algorithm works. Okay, great. Because I'll be talking about airborne remote sensing. So it'd be fantastic if we could have some kind of flyover at the same time to sort of look at a difference of scales. Ah. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'm presenting next. Apologies. Thank you. Huh? Great. Thanks, Michelle. Grant? Yeah, great presentation, Shelly. Thank you so much. And uh, just wanted to uh, let everyone know that, that Brian and I are, are definitely um, putting the word out to CASCO and member agencies about this uh, playbook. C couple of things that I, I'm thinking about uh, are, I, I mean, because we, we actually have, uh, I think, a lot of, uh, potentially a lot of untapped data when it comes to uh, volunteer cleanups that are done uh, throughout the state. Um, you know, that those, those are sometimes opportunities to collect good information about, um, uh, about where trash um, is prevalent in, within water bodies. I know, you know, th there are usually attempts to collect record data associated with most volunteer volunteer cleanups but um, maybe if there if there were a way to integrate something like this into those volunteer cleanups and even I'm even thinking about you know because I look at a lot of data that comes in from um, our maintenance of drainage infrastructure uh, you know as it relates to uh, flood control channels that double as receiving waters and you know, I'm trying to think, you know, how can, you know, I see a lot of data, but it usually comes in as weight or volume. How, you know, how can we begin to, to make better use of that data as it relates to uh, what, what you all have done with this playbook? So just, just some things to, to think about, but, but great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and we've been, um, through the trash monitoring work group, we have the citizen science uh, subcommittee we've been working with, and, and they're aware of, of uh, the playbook and we're looking at working with, um, with them and others. Um, I, th I saw that Wynn was on the, on the call as well. He's, he's been working with the Pinal Creek uh, folks up um, in Northern California, and they wanna use our methods as well uh, to, to start collecting their data. So thanks, Grant. Great, thanks so much, Shelly. Looking forward to seeing what comes next and, and the work of the future for the Trash Mining Work Group. Thanks again for coming today. Thanks for the invite, Nick. Great. Next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Michelle Geert from the uh, NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory talking about remote sensing of plastic debris. Let me um, stop sharing my screen and let her take okay. over. Can you see it? I, I can. 
Okay, perfect. And is it in that split screen or is it just the one image? Oh, I think uh, it's the right now it's in the split screen, yeah. Apologies, I'll fix that right now. There we go. Okay, so mm. yeah, I'll be talking. Can you see it? It still looks like split screen for me, but maybe it's just me. Oh no. Um, it just looks like half of it's, yeah. Oh. Um. Um. Is that better? No, it, it's almost like, yeah, it just, it looks like it, half of your PowerPoint's cut off, like half of the images are cut off. Oh no, okay. Oh wait, there we go, that's better. Okay, Oof. <laughs> when in doubt, just keep trying, right? Yeah. Um, so what I'll be talking about with you guys today is a pilot project that at, I'm at, I'm sorry, I should, step back. I'm Michelle Girac. I'm at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. So what I'll be talking about is the potential to use remote sensing that from airborne and potentially spaceborne down the road um, to towards this problem of marine plastic pollution. Um, so we have a data science pilot that JPL has funded for some internal seed funding. And so I'll be talking about that at the end, but I sort of just wanted to set the stage. I think all of us are familiar with these types of imagery. Obviously this is from Los Angeles specifically, which is where past, well, where I am, but this is probably true. And you all have probably seen images like this throughout the state of California. Um, plastic pollution is a problem. It's a global crisis. We know that the amount of plastic entering our waterways is significant and it's only going to increase orders of magnitude in the next decade. And there's this nice sort of estimate that's been put out by the Ocean Conservancy stating that realistically a cargo ship's worth of plastics will enter our waterways. So both lakes, rivers, and oceans every single day by 2030. I wanna say California is a great use case or excellent study domain being sort of a microcosm, if you will, of a national plastic pollution problem that has global scalability. So I think California is also great from the perspective that we're really, you all are taking great steps towards prevention and removal of plastic. I'm um, having, you know, established a trash amendment with a goal of zero percent trash entering our waterways by 2030. So I think the question is, is how could, if I can promote my slides, you know, how can remote sensing possibly aid in that? Because I think we've heard in some of the presentations, um, some of the in-situ infrastructure is fantastic, but perhaps it's, it's, not, it's spatially and temporally limited. So could we sort of leverage remote sensing to sort of fill in the gaps? And this is sort of where JPL and NASA comes in. So what can we do with remote sensing assets to improve our understanding of the problem, but also to track progress? So first the question is why remote sensing, right? It does provide us with a non-invasive way to sort of look at the earth system as Shelley showed with drones, which is a type of remote sensing approach. It allows us to sort of span a much larger area in a short amount of time and expend less labor and possibly expenses. It also sort of fills in, if you will, it provides a nice complement between more of this, this is more the in situ where you get more um, detail with regards to what substance you're trying to identify. And as you obviously go up in scale, it's sort of limited uh, where you get more at a local point versus a, a large area where remote sensing does the opposite. It can tell you over a large area and then getting at the small scale, it may not do as much because as Shelley had mentioned, it depends on the altitude at which you would fly. For an aircraft and spacecraft, obviously we're limited to where you are. So I think it provides sort of a nice complement where we could meet in the middle. Also, there's been some recent literature that's indicated that it could be a viable source actually for detection, identification, quantification and tracking of plastic litter. However, it's still in its infancy. So if we look at this, they've sort of provided this nice little flow chart. Right now, I'd say we're more at the detection and identification stage, um, exploration of existing sensors with respect to this before we can extrapolate out. But, but still, there's progress that's being made. So the question next is how, right? So realistically, um, as I mentioned, it's an active area of research at present, it's still in its infancy, but the few papers that have been out there have actually shown that plastics do have unique optical signatures in the infrared, specifically the near infrared and shortwave. I mean, this approach has been done actually in the recycling centers with sorting and things of that sort. 
So it's, it's pretty applicable, if you will. Um, and specifically lab-based studies taking, as you can see here, uh, things, plastics that have washed ashore and someone's taken them in the lab and actually performed sort of spectral signature detection upon them. And what you sort of get is this. So basically 400 to 700 is what we see with our visible eyes. So it's the visible wavelengths and basically anything from 750 on is considered infrared. So the bands that we have highlighted here are the four distinct spectral signatures that plastics have shown. We typically disregard the 931 and this 1417 because there's also water absorption features at that theme. But realistically, we know that we can sort of rely upon this 1215 and 1732. Um, so with regards to that, since now we have this spectral Sort of signature, which you can think of it like our fingerprints, right? Every single person has a unique fingerprint from which, you know, unfortunately, if we do something bad, they can identify us. It's the same with plastics, as you can see here. So think of that spectral signature as its plastics fingerprint. So using that and applying it to something like airborne data, specifically hyperspectral. Um, so if you're curious what the heck is hyperspectral, you might have heard Shelley say multispectral. Multispectral is what we currently have up in space for ocean color sensors. So within the spectrum, they provide sort of chunks within the entire spectral range. So something like this, they would observe in this band and this band and this band. Hyperspectral provides every, let's say three nanometers, a, a, a key sort of spectral signature. So you get this much more contiguous sampling of the entire spectrum so that you can actually start teasing out some of these small sort of deviations or wiggles in the spectra itself that you can say something about more of what's in the water column, whether it's a particular type of phytoplankton, or in this case, is it plastic? Is it water, you know, different things. So from that perspective, um, this paper, uh, Garaba and Dearson of 2018, took an airborne image, specifically um, hyperspectral from some, an instrument we have at JPL called Avarice. And this is a scene actually, I think in the Inland Empire. Um, and you can see what you're basically detecting. Here's a landfill, and then it has like a bunch of buildings and sort of water, as you can see. So it's sort of showing a water target, a highway, a landfill. There's some vegetation and industrial warehouse rooftop. Taking the spectra associated with this, this image and knowing that sort of we're getting spectral features at this 1215 and 1732, we're able to sort of apply this algorithm, which is the hydrocar hydro excuse me, hydrocarbon index, which they use again for sorting plastics and sort of key features pop out. Key features, which we know are in fact sort of this plastic tarp that's going over the landfill itself. So it does show that we do through remote sensing, through hyperspectral, we're able to detect and tease out what is plastic versus non-plastic. But there are some limitations. There's always limitations, right? So realistically for remote sensing, as, as Shelly had mentioned again, with regards to altitude, the altitude at which you're flying airborne or spaceborne really governs the spatial footprint that you're seeing on the ground. So obviously the higher you go, the larger the footprint, the lower you go, the smaller the footprint. So at present with existing sort of remote sensing assets, we're able to sort of more see these macro plastic aggregates. I should preface that most of what we're doing right now is using existing remote sensing sensors that were not created for detection of marine plastic debris, right? They might've been created for uh, detection of, of terrestrial ecosystems or open ocean biology. So we're really exploring how the sort of limitations of these existing sensors, as well as proposing where we could go with future remote sensing capabilities. So right now we're really at this exploration stage, but with the existing sensors, again, we could do aggregates of macroplastics. So that sort of leads us to the next. I mentioned it's an exploration project. So to this effect, JPL has funded um, this pilot project with some seed funding, which I am the PI of. Um, and Mark Gold is one of our stakeholders as we have now this great MOU between the state of California and JPL. Um, and this is just one particular application of sort of that, that MOU. Um, so what we're proposing to do within this pilot project, which began in January, so we're still at the beginning stages. However, what we've been able to do thus far is, is shows extreme promise. As Shelly had mentioned, right now we're in the training stage. So we're looking at existing airborne assets, as you see here, going over known plastic targets, developing sort of that, that back-end sort of training data set from which then we can apply a whole bunch of images on to come up with these great maps 
map specifically of leakage sources. So we know that leakage sources is one of the huge unknowns in regards to US contributions to global ocean plastic waste. So leakage sources associated with landfills, recycling centers, how much is actually going into the rivers and waterways and then entering the open ocean and sort of accumulation regions. So where on the shoreline of California would we expect to see these plastic aggregates happening? Um, so how we're doing this is we're developing this prototype detection approach using machine learning based approaches. The one that we're specifically using is something that uh, sort of we built up and developed at JPL called MESMA. It basically looks at different spectral uh, features as in the previous one I showed you with those uh, specific fingerprints and it builds up a training data set and then it just applies it on a bunch of the images itself. But uh, so we're using these open source spectral libraries that already exist. So of different plastics and virgin plastics and using the great avarice um, airborne data record that we have in California um, that's been going on since 2013. So this was part of a preparatory campaign for a uh, NASA satellite mission um, that is still continuing because that satellite has not yet launched. So we have basically, as you can see here, just examples of the regions that we continuously cover um, on quite regular timescales of, of um, California, and we can use these actually, especially the ones that are going over the waterways, like in Los Angeles and other areas where we could start seeing with regards to sort of the main waterways or rivers, where is that accumulation happening? Um, so that is the plan. And uh, realistically, like everything, uh, we have the seed funding, it's going to establish the baseline, but I'm still actively pursuing internal and external funding sources um, for NASA specifically um, to sort of continue this effort going forward. As it has great traction, obviously nationally with this National Academy's US contributions to ocean plastic waste, uh, but also internationally with uh, multiple efforts underway. So. It'd be great and we'll keep you aware and uh, up to date if you're interested on our progress with respect to this. But realistically, I, I do I'm very optimistic with what I obviously showed you from existing studies and, and what I've seen thus far from this project that I think we could work from something like this. And granted, this is not California. This is at that um, massive sort of garbage dump that occurs on the big island of Hawaii. Um, but we could perhaps reach something more like this by your, your 2030 timeline by using remote sensing, perhaps to help complement and be synergistic with existing in-situ methods so that you can have a better measure of, of how well you're doing with respect to meeting that trash min zero percent. So that's it, you guys. Hopefully I got you excited about remote sensing. Thanks so much, Michelle. Uh, that was um, really cool. And um, I open it up. Oh, Terry, Terry Fleming, go ahead. Yeah, so I think this is great. And thank, thank you for um, for sharing this with us. I, I think one of the challenges is that, you know, the biggest sources of, uh, of plastics and, and trash is the stuff that we no longer send to China, the recyclables, and they go to other countries that have uh, more lax environmental standards. And there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of it gets into the ocean very, very quickly. And so I'm just wondering if there's possibilities to, to expand this to other areas that probably have um, greater sources. No, I, I'm so glad Gosh. you brought that up. So the way I was thinking about it is California is a great case for the national sense from US, right? But realistically, as I said, it has global scalability. So then if you looked, I have this other image, apologies, of the whole globe. And realistically, then it becomes a, a question of managed versus mismanaged, which I think you were getting at. So in the grand scheme of things, so California is a big component of the national, the US is, is rather small compared to you know, our Asian neighbors. So realistically, if we're able to do it well in the US, our approach will work wonders for these mismanaged systems because realistically, um, you know, they're not doing a lot with regards to the same approach as we are with landfills and recycling centers, right? It's just, and most of the time they're near rivers. Um, so realistically, if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere and, and get very good results. Thank you. Uh, Ray, go ahead. Hi, uh, another good presentation. I was just curious about the number of platforms that are out there. I, I, I seems like to have adequate coverage. You'd probably need satellite and aircraft. And I'm, so I was just curious. I know there's new satellites and stuff going up all the time. Is that, uh, and there's a lot of imagery. 
Definitely. So right now, as I mentioned, um, and, and Shelly had sort of touched on it too, you can use multispectral for um, to tease out more, like you really need hyperspectral, but realistically you could use the multispectral as an additional proxy to say, uh, it is, is it vegetation or is it sand or is it water? It can help you sort of tease out a little bit more, but you really need measurements within that near infrared and shortwave infrared. And with that, that really sort of takes down the existing assets we have at present. So Sentinel-2 is one that is up there that can that has some of those bands that we can use. And there's been a paper done with respect to that. Um, but realistically, from Spaceborne, that's almost it. Maybe you could use Worldview-3, but that's a commercial asset. And therefore, the data is not available to everybody. Um, but as you said, there's an advent of satellite remote sensors that are coming online and right now are in sort of formulation and preparation that realistically these studies that we're doing are so key because if we find that these are spe uh, specific spectral samples, spectral samplings that we need with a certain signal to noise, perhaps we can help sort of put requirements upon those existing ones in formulation to better address this problem, right? I feel we have some, some time for that, but also if they don't, coming up with the next satellite sensor that would really address this. So great point. Great. Well, thank you so much thank again, Michelle. Yeah. Up next, we have a presentation from Scott Coffin, a research scientist with the, the State Water Board's Division of Drinking Water. I'll go ahead and stop sharing so you can take over. All righty, thanks, Nick. Just pulling everything up right now. There we are. Alrighty, so sort of pulling from some language uh, from before, um, talked about the trash monitoring playbook. And now I'm going to introduce a, a new concept, which is uh, a playbook for monitoring and assessment of microplastics. So first, I want to give you all a brief overview of what the State Water Board has been doing in, in terms of microplastics and drinking water, and a little bit on the e ambient ecosystem side. And then I want to propose that we develop uh, or, or, or see what you think about developing and monitoring and assessment playbooks for microplastics similar to what we have for trash. So a little bit of background. We have two legislative mandates to research and, and monitor for microplastics and marine environment as well as in drinking water. So Senate Bill 1263 passed in 2018 requires the Ocean Protection Council in collaboration with the State Water Board to initiate a statewide microplastic strategy by 2022. And then by 2026, develop a risk assessment framework, uh, standardize methods, get some baseline occurrence data, uh, investigate the sources and pathways, and then go back to the legislature with recommendations for source reduction strategies. The bill that deals with drinking water also passed in 2018 is a bit simpler and it just requires that the state water board first define microplastics July 1st of last year, which we did. And then by July 1st of this year requires that we adopt a standardized method for years to perform four years of testing and analysis and then report the occurrence uh, to consumers as well as consider adopting a health-based guidance level. So uh, impl implicitly uh, perform a human health risk assessment and then provide accreditation for laboratories for monitoring. So a little bit of background on where this fits within the greater uh, drinking water scope. Uh, as you probably, a lot of you are aware, the uh, microplastics is an emerging contaminant. And so it where it fits in our in our typical path to regulation is that it's really in the investigatory stage where we're gaining an awareness of the occurrence and toxicity and gathering uh, occurrence data. Uh, and if we are to develop a health-based guidance level, uh, like a notification level, then it would enter this sort of non-regulatory or pseudo-regulatory stage. And, and so there's a, a really a ways off until we get to a public health goal, which is a, a prerequisite for developing an actual regulation uh, in terms of uh, maximum contaminant level. So 
a little bit out of the ordinary to be given a task from the from the legislature to explicitly start developing uh, the path to regulation for an emerging contaminant, uh, but but this is what we're working with. So, um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we adopted a definition of microplastics, and really this was meant for drinking water. However, we've already seen it be used by other agencies, uh, including um, mentioned by the Ocean Protection Council, as well as some um, be be used uh, for by different organizations even outside of the United States. And so what I'm highlighting here is the interaction or the the um, the way that that the efforts in drinking water can directly impact uh, and, and influence other organizations efforts in, in regards to microplastics. I'm sharing a definition as just uh, one of those potential overlaps. So I want to give you a little, a little bit of insight into what we've been, the, the work that we've been doing to develop a health-based guidance level to aid consumers in interpreting what microplastics in their drinking water means, as well as uh, um, the, another counterpart uh, in, in the Senate Bill 1263, which is to develop a risk assessment framework for ecological impacts. So having both these goals in mind, getting a, doing a human health risk assessment as well as an aquatic ecosystem risk assessment, we've already started combining forces. And uh, as, through a workshop facilitated through Squirp, started in October 2020 and is currently ongoing. Um, we have been working on developing uh, thresholds for microplastics and drinking water, as well as the aquatic ecosystem uh, with a number of partners shown here and many more partners not shown here. So a little background on the philosophy that we've developed through this. Uh, really generally, we're thinking about multiple thresholds that have different management actions related to different threat to, to each threshold. Um, for drinking water, this the low concern may be something like a notification level. The moderate concern may be something like a response level. Uh, for aquatic ecosystems, this may be the low concern may be uh, initiating uh, additional monitoring. Um, and then, you know, elevated or high concern might be something like a, a 3 or 3D listing, something like that. Uh, generally, how we are performing our risk assessment for both the aquatic and the human health risk assessments is a really a three-step process. First, we mined the, the literature for relevant microplastics hazard studies, performed a screening and prioritization based on different criteria that we came up with for applicability for risk assessment, uh, whether uh, the particles were well characterized and the experimental design of the study was, was sound. And then we proceeded on to a hazard identification where we go out to further expert review to identify uh, the, the hazards of these studies, uh, and then eventually getting to a dose, an actual dose response characterization, um, which is a little bit different than for the ecological risk assessment than for the humans, but the concept is, is quite similar. So I, I wanna give you a little bit of insights into some other work that we've been doing with the Division of Drinking Water that also ties in very closely with what's happening with the aquatic side, uh, the, the ambient aquatic side, which is the development of a standardized method. As many of you are aware, there are no standardized methods from analyzing microplastics. And so we needed to develop our own. This also fulfills the goal of SB 1263 to develop standardized methods by 2026. So we're tackling both the drinking water and the ocean water, fish tissue and sediment in one big uh, coordinated push. Uh, again, facilitated by Squirp. We've got over 40 participating organizations from at least seven different countries. Uh, some of the, you can see the diversity of the groups that are involved in this shown here. Uh, we, have, we have quite a few um, laboratories from academia. We also have government labs, uh, water utilities and um, chemical producers or, or industry, um, even um, you know, folks like Thermo Fisher that actually make the instruments that we use. So, some preliminary findings of our method interlab for drinking water. Uh, we, we just finalized or we just finished our, our method study uh, last Wednesday. And so we, we did find some 
we, we, we do have some preliminary conclusions that we can share. And the big picture is that each method has its own strengths and limitations. And really you want to tailor the method to your objective, just like what, uh, just like what Shelley was saying uh, in terms of looking for trash. Uh, you want to, it needs to be specific to what, to the answer, to the question that you want to answer. Uh, for drinking water, we have three methods that are well understood and reproducible and we feel would be good to go for providing accreditation and use for, for regular monitoring right now. Um, microscopy, uh, FTIR, and ROMing. So as I mentioned before, different methods for different objectives. So these different methods will give you different particle sizes. And that's really the critical component here that uh, it, it really drives the toxicity of these particles, is the, the size. So different costs associated with these different instruments, as well as different um, amounts of time required to actually run the samples. So for an example, a pyrolysis GCMS can run you anywhere between 25,000 if you're just getting the pyrolyzer to 300,000 if you're getting the pyrolyzer and the GCMS. Um, Whereas an optical microscope, you can get it for as cheaply as $700, and you'll be able to characterize particles down to 100 microns. You might not be able to tell if they're plastic or not, uh, but you can answer some objectives or some questions for certain objectives. So now that we have our standardized method, we can accredit laboratories uh, so that the data that we get for drinking water is comparable. and just as a reminder, our Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program, ELAP, uh, also accredits laboratories for environmental, mo environmental monitoring as well. So once we get it set up for drinking water, uh, it'll be a lot easier to get laboratories online for uh, additional matrices. So for the, the laboratory accreditation, we had a breakout group that was tasked with defining the three parts to accreditation. Uh, first was getting a, a, an inspection checklist for labs, which they did. The second was developing the documentation needs for laboratories, which they also accomplished. And the third was providing recommendations for what performance evaluation samples would or should be like uh, once, once they become available. Um, this they also did. However, we're still waiting on actual manufacturers to make these performance evaluation samples. Uh, currently, no one in the world does this, but we're hoping that some labs um, step up and provide these so that we can actually evaluate laboratory performance. So once we have a lab, or sorry, once we have uh, a method and we've accredited the labs and we have some idea of the health-based guidance level, uh, then we, we can go out and start monitoring. So the four years of testing and analysis, um, one of the things that I want that, that came out of our workshop that I want you all to, to understand sort of big picture here is that we came up with a different, a, a tiered monitoring framework. I mentioned that different methods have different purposes. And one of the things we realized very early on with this is that some of these methods take a considerable amount of time and expense in order to run. Uh, for instance, these the micro FTI, micro FTIR can take uh, about 18 hours to run a single sample. We don't want to be requiring every water system in California to use a very expensive time consuming method when we don't think that it's actually necessary. Likewise, if you're doing monitoring in the marine environment, you might not want to use uh, something like FTIR for every single sample. When you have, when you can use a surrogate method or a cheaper, faster method that can get you the information that you need. So we proposed a tiered monitoring framework. Tier one would be something like a screening method. It's, it's a surrogate uh, that gets you some level of information about whether or not you might have a problem. Tier two would be something rapid that gets you information about the particles, or sorry, the, the actual plastic. This could be something like pyrolysis GCMS. Tier three would be actually running it through the, the expensive instrumentation, FTAR or Raman. So, this is just another way of visualizing this. This is actually a decision tree. Uh, it's quite, the, quite similar to the, the other slide, but effectively you can see um, that different tiers have different thresholds associated with them that are again based on uh, the, the, human, the, the health effects or the, the risk thresholds for aquatic ecosystems. Uh, and you can see that the baseline here is again, surrogate monitoring um, that we, we want 
as many, uh, as much surrogate monitoring as we possibly can get. Um, at this point, we haven't decided what surrogates we want to pursue, but we have a long candidate list of potential surrogates that we would want to develop and validate for drinking water, uh, which could be used for aquatic ecosystems as well. Uh, it could be something like total organic carbon, uh, particle counts. Um, we have a very long, um, long list that we'd like to validate. So this really ties in, uh, the four-year sampling and analysis in drinking water um, ties in uh, a little bit to the goal in SB 1263 to get baseline occurrence data, as well as investigating sources and pathways. When we're monitoring for surface or for, for source water, for drinking water, um, some of the surface water that we'll be monitoring may be may give us a lot of information that could be useful for looking at sources and pathways. Um, some of these are rivers that that flow uh, out to sea. Um, and so we can dovetail some of the monitoring efforts here and, and share information. So just to show you the timeline uh, and, and seeing where SB 1422, 1422 and 1263 uh, line up, um, you can see here. And just to let you know, uh, we, we have been coordinating um, quite a bit with the Ocean Protection Council uh, to make sure that we can leverage each other's efforts here. But we would like to continue to uh, leverage these efforts uh, going forward. And so with that, I propose that we develop a monitoring and assessment playbook for microplastics. Again, the principal aim would be to leverage drinking water microplastics work for ambient ecosystems and likewise. And I propose that we do this through consolidating, consolidating efforts between the different organizations uh, that are working on microplastics, just a couple shown here. Uh, this might be done through forming some sort of working group, uh, and then we can identify the common goals between organizations and we can draft research objectives. Um, some examples of things that we're already doing, in addition to uh, interagency, we also have a lot of sharing going on in the academic community uh, through open spectral libraries like Open Specky, Slop Ramen. Uh, we, we've also built a decision support tool that's open, open source and open data called Tomex, can be used by anyone in the world. And we are doing a lot of, of these sort of uh, brain trust uh, sharing of ideas through the, the trash data dives that, that happen annually. So with that, I'd like to, uh, if we have some time, Nick, might want to open this up to discussion to get folks' thoughts about the uh, proposition that I raised. Absolutely. Thanks, Scott. Um... Terry, you got your hand up. Yeah, uh, thanks, Scott. And I think this idea of having a playbook is great, and I like your your tiered strategy. Uh, I was just wondering if things like flow through uh, fluorometers or cytometers could be used to look at microplastics in you know ocean waters. Yes, yeah, so that's actually on our the top of the, our list for one of the surrogates that we'd like to validate. We believe flow cytometry might be quite useful. Thanks for bringing that up. I see in your second bullet, you you say um, form working group. Are you suggesting you would form something separate from the already existing trash working group? It might it might just be a subgroup of that. Okay. I'm sure a lot of the expertise would be shared, but one of the one of the things that came about during our method development work, uh, we had about like I mentioned, 40 labs, and I think it was about 100 people actually involved. Many of them mentioned that they wanted to continue to have these conversations with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, California is really leading the way globally on efforts for microplastics uh, in general, and especially when it comes to drinking water. And so a lot of stakeholders from out, especially out of state, mentioned that they want to be part of the conversation. They want to, they want to um, continue to exchange information and are hoping that we could have some sort of platform for that. And so I was thinking this might be an opportunity to, to bring in those um, other stakeholders. Okay, thanks. Uh, Shelly, Shelly Walther. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you, Scott, for coming today to, to present uh, your, uh, your recommendations and, and to have this discussion. Um, I, I, I really like the idea of increased collaboration amongst these different groups. And as you know, I've been very active in, in microplastics efforts. Uh, and they're a, a 
additional um, areas to collaborate that we could also think of um, amongst uh, different agencies and, and also other uh, method validation efforts such as ASTM um, that would be would fit really nicely with all of this. And also uh, the pathway that gets forgotten or, or just let, neglected because it's not water, but air um, that uh, is likely a massive pathway going directly to the oceans, um, not captured in any other um, measurements. So uh, I'd like to get, get air people involved too. That's a great point. Mark? Yeah, Sky, I, I mean, I, it seems like a very um, common sense, straightforward recommendation. I can't imagine anybody not being really supportive. Do, I mean, does it make sense just to want, want to put together sort of a, a mini proposal and, and then we can just, you know, talk about it. Either it can be a subcommittee or it can come back here or whatever the case may be. I'm just trying to figure out a way to sort of move this more quickly than perhaps the normal path. Um, and I'm not, and I'm pretty clueless on, you know, what are we talking about from the standpoint of time, effort, cost, and that would come out in a proposal and give me a better idea. Yeah, that, that's a great idea, Mark. Um, I think I, I can definitely draft that. I, I think I wanted to use this opportunity to get everyone's idea about what what those sort of efforts would look like. What what this what this um, would we be looking for funding? Uh, you know, creating like a common funding uh, or just maybe helping write requests for proposals, things like that. Um, wondering more of like the, the actual details, hoping folks can weigh in on that. Yeah, I mean, we're, we just so people know OPC and it, it's one of the things that I've in, enjoyed the most about, about working there is that um, we don't necessarily have to have competition for um, for proposals. So we don't have to, to do things that we can actually, you know, determine, oh, we want so-and-so and such and such to work on something. If it's something, you know, if we really think they're by far the best group to do it. Um, and also anything below 200 grand, I don't have to go to uh, the OPC for approval. So it, so it just depends. There's some flexibility there. And I know this, I'm seeing Holly on my screen as well. I know this is the sort of thing that's a really high priority for, for OPC and for both of us. Steve. Uh, oh, right. let, let, looks like Holly wanted to go <laughs> I was realizing I should raise my hand. Um, sorry about that. Um, so I guess one question I have is because I realize that the methods work for drinking water has just started wrapping up and the work on validating the methods for ambient water and fish tissue and sediment is gonna be ongoing through the summer. So what does the timing of this look like? And I'm not sure what kind of write-ups are coming out of that particular project. Uh, uh, timing for the drinking water component or, or timing for the proposal? Uh, uh, I guess timing for like development of this work group as it relates to the methods validation work that Squirp's doing on the ambient water, I, I see. I, I I see this as something that we could initiate right away. Okay. It's really it's really up to the logistics of if we want to fold it into a breakout group of the trash monitoring work group, or if we need to, or if we believe that we should form a brand new group. Um, maybe Shelly or someone that's more plugged into the trash monitoring group, work group could speak to this, but my understanding is that they're currently covering both macro and microplastics. They are, but uh, they, they tend to focus on, on macroplastics and um, on, on this MS4 side. Thanks. And also homeless encampments. So um, it's certainly something that we've discussed though, that, that we should have more of a microplastics element in the trash monitoring work group. And, and um, it's something that we could um, agendize for the next work group meeting and start there. And then 
um, have that internal discussion and um, then uh, follow up just by email with uh, other groups and then um, develop by the time we have our next council meeting. Yep. Thanks. Steve. And then so intriguingly, what I was going to say is very similar to what Holly uh, was asking about. Um, and I'm going to have small differences with Scott on this. First off, uh, the, the overall proposal to continue uh, to make this, uh, wh whether it's done in the, in the present trash group or as a subcommittee, doesn't, doesn't matter, whatever works there. But, but I think there's a real need for it because I think the key bullet is consolidating effort across groups. Microplastics is gonna touch a number of groups um, all the way up to, as Shelley was saying, the atmospheric people, um, so, which ultimately leads into the ocean. So we need to develop some coordination across that. I, I think the issue though is, is timing um, because as was brought up, we have almost finished, 90% finished kind of where we're at with what we call the clean water matrix. But we're also in this evaluation study doing uh, fish tissue, uh, sediment, and we call dirty water, basically algae added things. We basically have to do some pre-digestion types of steps. Um, those data won't be um, uh, even reaching us for data analysis for until the end of this month. We've given people to just the pandemic issue. And then we'll probably need about three or four months for the labs that participated in that to do the process that we just went through to all agree upon what that says. So I think, you know, well, I don't wanna slow the process down. I think we'll have a more meaningful set of information for the work group to work from in about five or six months. And that would probably be the kickoff point the, so we should use the time to kind of get set, um, knowing stuff that's coming and knowing what we have from the drinking water. Um, but we'll have a lot more information for what I think the council would be interested in cutting across matrices in about six months. Great. Well, thank you. In the respect of time, and I know that Mark has a heart out. Now he's only got three minutes left. Um, let's move on and, and we'll circle back. I think this might be an, an agenda item for the next council meeting or the one after to kind of yeah, circle back with the trash mining work group and, and develop a plan and, and report back to the council for feedback. Sounds like the timing is right for that. Okay. Um... Oops. So I know you only have two, I know now you have three minutes, two minutes. Quick, but yeah, yeah quickest brainstorm in history. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that is, I think has struck everyone here, not, not just me by any stretch, um, is that, you know, we have uh, this incredible capacity and expertise in this group, um, yet this challenge that I alluded to earlier um, in the meeting of trying to get uh, secure funding as opposed for, for monitoring. It's just been, you know, it, it, as great as this committee has been or this council has been, that has not been a success um, story here. And the reality is, is that um, if you think about everybody who's on here and who, you know, who's represented by the people who are on here, you know, I think there's, there's a great deal of potential there um, from the standpoint of really having a greater impact here. And, um, you know, it shouldn't be that, you know, every, every time we need some monitoring money, it's, you know, it's hat in hand and you're lucky to get a, a couple of years and there's no continuous um, issue. And this is just literally coming up on, on every single thing that we're working on, you know, and whether it's beach water quality or ocean acidification or trash, you know, there, there just is not a regular um, uh, reliable funding source. And then I think the issue that we've seen you know, I know everybody's doing this out of the goodness of their heart, you know, in regards to, um, uh, you know, wastewater, epi. I mean, that's all coming out of people's own individual budgets. Um, and then, you know, we see something like the largest wildfire season 
in in history in the state of California, and we don't have a comprehensive monitoring program to see what the impacts of that are to everything from drinking water and receiving waters, et cetera, et cetera. So we all know that this is this is a big a big problem, and it struck us again, you know. And I know um, Nick and Karen and I talked about this um, quite a bit, you know, months and months ago about you know, this is a budget that in theory could have helped out in a significant way because, you know, it's it's pretty much the biggest surplus in state history. Um, and like I said, you know, keep an eye on on what's in um, the May revise that comes out next week. But it just, we just get no traction whatsoever um, in light of other priorities at the State Water Board, other priorities at Cal EPA, other priorities at the Natural Resources Agency um, to really, you know, get, uh, you know, a dedicated funding source for monitoring of any type. And so I'm sure if you follow the Ocean Protection Council, you see, you know, we'll, we'll fund the creation of a monitoring effort or a couple of years of a monitoring effort, but we, we're not set up to keep doing this. Um, on a on a regular um, basis, and I think we're you know we're really seeing the problem of this um, moving forward, especially when we start looking at climate impacts and a lot of different issues as well. And so, really, what this was was um, trying to make sure that we're all going to have this discussion in a serious way and try to strategically figure out what we can do. We're in it. Karen and I are in an awkward spot, and I would say Nick in the same, obviously in the same boat, which is like we're we're not we're not really in a great spot to sort of ask for money and get it done um, at the state level. If there's a specific proposal that came from someone else or whatever, sometimes we're asked to weigh in, but it's not like, hey, here's the big budget, you know, you got X number of dollars, you know, how are you going to spend it? It just doesn't work that way. And so in a lot of circumstances, things that we can't do is we're not allowed to push for any legislation at all. Some of you guys may be, you know, um, and so if you have those sorts of relationships, that's something that, you know, you may want to ponder in these in this area. Since we're not going to really impact this this budget session unless um, unless a couple of you guys on your own are best friends with people who, uh, you know, are chair of budget subcommittees um, that are you know, making decisions as we speak, um, then, you know, the reality is this is this is a longer term discussion. I just wanted to tee it up. I'm not, I don't think it, frankly, mostly maybe because not, maybe not everybody wants to get involved in it. Doesn't really make sense that it's necessarily a working group or whatever. I mean, it's something that honestly, we should all really want to make happen because it's it's going to benefit, you know, the mission on um, the mission of the council. Um, and so I was just gonna leave it at that. Obviously the example here on the bottom um, is the pending legislation on AB 1066. You know, many of you, I know friends and colleagues, you know, experienced the problems with AB 411 with basically hoping that the feds would provide, you know, full funding for beach monitoring and the state, you know, matched in a much smaller level. but you know, that obviously changed from administration to administration. And so the end result is we saw, we've seen all sorts of variability, even on something like beach water quality monitoring, which has been, you know, under, you know, in the public eye really from the very beginning. Um, and so that's just an example of, you know, if this bill passes, where's the, where's the monitoring dollars gonna come from to try to, to, try to make that happen? Um, so that's just another example. I'm not saying that, you know, beaches, it, you know, in it, freshwater beaches are the top priority of this group by any stretch. I'm just bringing it up as it's going to be yet another problem that we're trying to, to deal with in this arena. Um, that's about all I got time for, Nick. I, I don't know, and, and Karen, so I'm not sure what you want to do from that from here. It seems like people are interested based on the chat. Um, in in getting into this in more detail but um you know that's what that's what i hope we can spend some time working on um in the future i appreciate, I appreciate that. that 
Um, I think the probably maybe the next step, I, I realize I, we ran out of time and I apologize. Um, no, those were but, great presentations. Yeah, so you I, shouldn't sorry. apologize at all. Um, but maybe, I mean, there, this has been a, one of the things that we moved from, from the governance document was exa specific examples of subcommittees. And one of them was a funding subcommittee. And I think that if that could be an option, uh, I mean, those are obviously intended to be more short term uh, and, and uh, be populated by council members um, to discuss these sort of things. Um, I think that if there was a subcommittee created, it'd have to be include some of the, the private and the members that represent sectors that don't have the constraints that the state representatives have um, to really talk about uh, in, a, in a more detail opportunities and, and how to organize better and actually start actions now to, you know, at, at, to your point to, to start impacting next year's budget or, or you know, approach that effort. Um, um, so I, I guess I would ask, you know, are there, are there members in attendance today that would be interested in working specifically on the topic of identifying funding for not just the council, but the, the work groups itself, themselves, um, in some fashion or another and, and exploring um, strategies for doing that. Yes. So Steve, I know Steve's been active in the past and, and maybe um, if you raise your hand then I can have the contact list of who to follow up with um, in the next week or two and hopefully, so I got, I got Steve, I got, I got Wynn who's a, a work group representative. Obviously. Oh. As he's doing this, Mark, I'll just say that we've had this conversation before when bond acts were under consideration and, and the, talked about the council getting more active in trying to define what are some of the needs to achieve this monitoring that we, as you correctly point out, have not been successful in following through. So what you're asking for, though, is something we have talked about in the past and I strongly support. Yeah, and what, but what's unusual is I'm telling you guys, when you see next week, you're going to go, oh, my gosh, that's basically a mini bond is getting funded on, um, uh, you know, a climate, you know, related bond okay. with, with a lot of money for water, a lot of money for wildfire, you know, fish and wildlife getting way more money than they've had in decades, you know, so there's a lot of stuff going on, but I swear it's like monitoring is a four letter word when it comes to funding and, um, but these decisions can't be made without monitoring. I, I've been fighting like crazy to try to get, you know, just an allocation so that we can, you know, get the most out of the MOU with J JPL um, rather than, you know, as a state, rather than everybody just sort of in their each individual departments and agencies, you know, just doing the work that they've been doing. It, us taking a bigger picture approach on that. It, even that's been a struggle in, in trying to get, funding but you know wildfire has done really really well but it's going to all be lidar as an example i'm exaggerating but i mean that's that's a lot of what's going on and and, and it's just tough to make the sell but i think you know i think obviously your sectors saying how important this is and why it's so important you know could change the mindset there I, i'm just saying for us internally it, it's been like beating our heads against the wall Yeah, and with that, I got it. I got to jump. So I'm obviously on any committee related to that. Right. And so whoever else joins, I, that's great. And thank you for any help that comes from that. Yeah, so thanks, Mark. Thanks for right. spending extra time with us. Thank you. You got it. Bye. Yeah. And thanks, Mark. Nick, add me to the list as well. Sure. Um, I think we need some more help from like the our, our 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 council members that represent the public and the regulated communities that have a little bit more. Um, flexibility. They have legislative analysis and. and sure. Um, I mean, I, I, I'll, areas, I'll, I think, I'll be. Uh, you know, yeah, so far, you, I've got you, the state you, you agencies and, and Steve. Um, and then, you know, Wynn had his hand up. I don't know if he had something to say or if you were volunteering. Lynn. Did we lose Nick? Looks like he froze. Yeah, he's off my screen. 
Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, it was because uh, Steve was the host. Oh. Uh, sorry, I got kicked off. <laughs> so, like I, I'd also like to volunteer. Okay, so uh, sorry, I got kicked off. Um, I got re-signed in, so I missed it. Uh, it was, I got Grant. Um, did anybody else speak up while I was disconnected? Yeah, this is Ray. Okay, great. That's helpful. Okay, well, we'll start with that. That That's a great start, I think, with that. that we got some good entities there that'll help. So I appreciate it. And we'll report back. So the oh, I think I lost my screen share. Okay, hold on. Apologies. So the, the, the final item um, is to talk about the next council meeting, August 12th. Um, I just want to reemphasize that the kind of the key part of it is that I'm going to be out for most of the quarter um, with limited access. I mean, I'm sure I'll have time to try to, to check in while I can. And I can help with a lot of the template pieces, but I just want to make sure that the council does want to have a meeting on our 12th, recognizing that I won't be as um, available to, to help with the coordinating and planning pieces of it. Um, that was kind of a big I was trying to kind of get a feeling for if that was something that the council wanted to pursue. It seems like the answer is yes. Um, I've provi provided some potential topics um, here, but I just want to make sure that, that I'm reading the room properly that yes, the council does indeed want to have a scheduled meeting on August 12th. I think that you raise your hand or thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think we want to have a meeting and I will, um... I will work with some of my staff to fill in, but we'll rely on those of you who are the leads on the items we pick for the meeting to be responsive. And, you know, Nick's a hound dog. I'm not going to claim that I'm going to be, nor are my other staff going to be as good at hound dogging as Nick is. <laughs> so um, commit to being responsive, please. Yeah, I've got some some feedback from um, from Brian Lawrence, and he he said that he'd be able to help where he can. I know Shelley's mentioned that as well with the Jedi topic, and um, I think she's going to help out with the microplastics. Um, and then obviously the subcommittee. I mean, the funding discussion could be something that takes up a significant amount of time, especially it's, it's a little bit easier with the condensed meeting, as you saw today, that we actually are way are already over. But um, uh, that's great. I'm happy to hear it. Uh, does anybody uh, have I any other that, ideas? Yeah, go ahead. yeah go ahead. Uh, a WBE follow-up. Um, uh, I think that there's going to be development from that, and um, I'll be t getting in touch with Steve Weisberg, who who asked that I, you know, uh, maybe be a liaison to 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 some of that work as well. Um, and then there will also be the uh, OEH modeling uncertainty workshop on May 28th, and I think there'll be some information to report out in terms of you know, maybe, uh, more information about what's needed for monitoring at that time in August, possibly. We, we can uh, you know, just throw it out as a, as a potential item for now. Great. Well, that's plenty, I think, um, for uh, the three hour time period that we have now. Did did we um did Greg have any more pieces of his uh, um, educational pieces for the Jedi? Um, he has, I believe, he does um, to, to full trainings that he he coordinates, and he was on here for a minute and's gone. Is usually around between six to eight hours, so he does. But I think because of the Jedi subcommittee didn't meet or discuss things over the last quarter, um, it just got kind of lost, and there wasn't room on the agenda anyway this time. But he's open, right? I think to talking more about it with that group and figuring out next steps. Okay, as a council, we'd already kind of decided that we valued having those um, presentations, and so I'd like to continue that. But then we have our half days, so I'm not sure how that will work. But um, I, I think we all value having that continue. They're excellent and really informative. Yeah, and that, that's that's great. I think that you know what it would take would be to, uh, working with 
to Greg to develop exactly what the next pieces would, would look like. And it might have to be maybe a specific a session, like a either it might happen outside of an official quarterly council meeting where it's a special meeting on um, like a training session for the council and or other people that are interested, the work groups, um, et cetera, to, talk, to think about how these topics are implemented into our personal and professional lives. So I think it's going to take a kind of working directly with him in, in the interim and then developing a plan. Okay. I, I was under the impression that that was already, you know, that his, his uh, modules were kind of already set, but uh, that, that would be great. And um, whether we do it as a separate meeting, as long as we get, you know, uh, as enough participation, that'll be key. Yeah, his modules are set more for a water board, a regional water board specific set um, that he built off of, but um, so. Okay. All right, well, um, if, there's, if there's nothing else, um, thank you all. And the recording should be up shortly, uh, either today or tomorrow and um, available for distribution. But thank you all for the great topics today. Thank you to our presenters. Uh, welcome Alma, I see you on there. If you wanna turn on your video and say hi. Um, I know we met, I think we met last time, um, but uh, thank you to Jared and welcome to Alma and uh, thank you all again. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. And you, good, good luck, Nick. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks, Thanks, Nick. Nick. Thank you. <laughs> and I, I'm assuming we'll be virtual in August, correct? Uh, I think it's a safe assumption, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All Bye, right. everybody. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Take care.